Our listeners, a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's midday and you're with the live desk here on GB News with myself, Martin, and with Ellie, coming up on this Monday lunchtime. GB News is told that a significant number of counter-terrorism firearms officers have stepped back from armed duties. Commanders are now in crisis meetings with the military on standby to respond to any serious incidents in the capital. We'll be live from Scotland Yard. And we're also live from the island of Lampedusa, where more than 11,000 migrants have arrived from North Africa in just the past 10 days. This week, Home Secretary Suella Braverman will urge Western leaders to come together to help combat the global migrant crisis. And Rishi Sunak continues to face a Tory backlash over plans to scrap HS2, with former Chancellor George Osborne saying the move would be an act of huge economic self-harm. We'll have all the latest reaction from Westminster. And as well as that, we'll be looking back on what was, of course, a triumph mm. for British teams in the Rugby World Cup, with England, Scotland and Wales all recording huge wins in their group games. But before we kick off, no. here are latest news headlines. I like that. Very clever. With <laughs> Aaron Armstrong. Good afternoon. It's a minute past 12. I'm Aaron Armstrong. GB News has learned a significant number of armed counter-terrorism officers in London have stepped back from duties amid an escalating crisis over their legal protection. It comes after a colleague was charged with murder over the shooting of an unarmed black man, Chris Caba, in South London last year. Almost all armed response vehicles in the capital have also handed in their firearms permits. Senior Met Police commanders are in crisis discussions in an attempt to ensure London has an adequate level of protection. The military has been put on standby to respond in the event of a terror attack. Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth says people need confidence in the police. It's vital that they, that they have support, but there are also safeguards in place. Now, there's been a, a review announced by the Home Secretary. We don't know the details of that review yet. There's also that live uh, prosecution, that court case. So I want, to be, I want, as a politician, to be careful about how I comment on these matters, as you, would, as you would appreciate. But we obviously need to make sure we have uh, procedures in place which commands the confidence of both the police officers and the communities they serve. The mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, says the North shouldn't have to pay for the government's mismanagement of the HS2 budget. Rishi Sunak is refusing to guarantee the planned line between Birmingham and Manchester. Uh, he's refer refusing to confirm it will be completed. He'll discuss the future of it with the Chancellor this week, with a decision expected before the Tory party conference in Manchester next week. But the Prime Minister insists he is committed to levelling up. This kind of speculation that people are you know, making is not right. I mean, we've got spades in the ground, we're getting on and delivering. But across the north, what we're also doing is connecting up all the towns and cities of, uh, in the north, east to west. That's a really important part of how we will create jobs, drive growth across the region, all part of our plans to level up. Free ports are another good example of that, whether that's in Teesside or elsewhere, attracting new investment, new businesses coming in, all good examples of the government levelling up. The Home Secretary will call for unity amongst Western leaders to combat the global migration crisis. 
Sheila Braverman will tell an audience in Washington that other countries can learn from the UK's attempts to tackle illegal migrants. She's questioning whether conventions and legal frameworks designed more than 50 years ago are still fit for purpose. And she's calling for a shake-up to the international rules. One million NHS appointments have been cancelled since December because of strikes in England. Last week's industrial action by junior doctors and consultants means the country will reach that milestone in figures set to be announced today. Another double strike is scheduled for next week. The organisation's deputy chief executive, Saffron Cordery, has labelled it damaging and demoralising. Meanwhile, almost 400,000 patients in England waited 24 hours or more in A&E last year. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine is calling the situation a matter of national shame. A Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, says 24 hours in A&E is no longer just a documentary. But the Department of Health and Social Care claims improvements are being made through the NHS recovery plan. Prosecutors are seeking a retrial of Lucy Letby on one count of attempted murder. The former nurse was jailed for life last month for the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of six others at a hospital in Chester in 2015 and 2016. Uh, jurors were unable to reach a verdict on six further counts of attempted murder. The CPS is seeking that retrial on count 14 only, which relates to the attempted murder of child Kay. Uh, she denied the charges and has launched an appeal. Experts are warning the government won't meet its manifesto pledge to end homelessness by next year. The Curse Lake Commission says there are chronic and unresolved issues in the housing system, with a crisis pushing more people onto the streets. Now, the number of people sleeping rough last autumn was 25% higher than at the same time three years ago. Uh, the government says sp spending £2 billion should end rough sleeping for good. Police searching for a missing mother have arrested a 31-year-old woman who attended an East London police station. The woman was also taken to hospital as a precaution. Two children reported missing from a centre for vulnerable mothers and children in London were found safe and well in Harwich earlier today. Officers were looking for the 31-year-old Jamie Lee Kelly, who left the facility on Tuesday with her three-year-old daughter and newborn baby boy. This is GB News. We're live on your TV, on digital radio and smart speaker too. Now it's back to Martin and Ellie. Good afternoon. You're watching the live desk for the very first time yes. with Martin and myself. Very, very good to be with you this afternoon. And as always, this show is nothing without you. So do get in touch with your views, your opinions on any of the stories that we are talking about this afternoon. We love to hear from you, don't we? Always do, yeah. It's gbviews at gbnews.com. So let's get into our top story, shall we now? Because GB News has learned a large number of Met Police counterterrorism firearms officers have stepped back from armed duties, with almost all armed response vehicles in London opting for a period of reflection. Mm, senior Met commanders are in talks to ensure the capital has an adequate response to firearms incidents, whilst the military is on standby in the event of a terrorist attack. Well, it follows the CPS last week charging a Met firearms officer with murder over the shooting of an unarmed black man, Chris Caber, in South London. While GB News' national reporter, Theo Jacomba, is at Scotland Yard for us now. Good afternoon to you, Theo. This is significant, isn't it? It is indeed. Well, Scotland Yard's firearm command is up against some challenges at the moment, particularly as a large number, as you've just referred to, of firearmed officers have handed in their tickets, essentially a license for them, allowing them uh, to use firearms during their duties. There's several thousand of them, and of course they can be called to various situations depending on when they are needed. The Home Secretary, though, Suella Bravman, has launched a review into uh, armed officers and of course this situation has been also accepted by uh, the Met's police uh, commissioner, uh, Sir Mark Rowley as well, welcoming uh, this review. But what it means though, there are questions about what this will mean uh, for the safety of people in London. These of course are officers who are called into some of the uh, biggest escalated cases across the capital and there have been some requests to other um, forces and some of those will be drafted in and as you've also 
been mentioned, uh, will have some um, army officials who will come in uh, to support them um, when they are needed. It's worth stressing, though, that those uh, members of the SAS won't be in the capital uh, patrolling the city, but they'll only be needed. Uh, they'll be used when they are needed and called upon. Earlier today, though, we heard from the housing minister, and this is what she had to say very important um, that we support our extremely brave firearms officers. They have to make split-second decisions to keep the public safe and, and they have our full support in doing that. I think it's really important that your listeners know that that cooperation with the soldiers, with the Military of Defence is very standard for the government. It's something that I've been involved with previously as a minister in different departments and of course those are professionals. They will work with the Met Police. Um, the soldiers will be working to keep the public safe. They won't have powers of arrest, uh, but ultimately these are operational matters for the police, for the Met Police Commissioner, uh, and keeping the public safe in whatever eventuality will be their first priority. Well, the Home Secretary has offered a message of support to those officers, many of them who have concerns about potentially ending up in the dock if they do use their firearms and they end up in the situation like we are seeing with the ongoing case of that officer who's currently unnamed for legal reasons who was uh, charged with murder last week uh, following uh, Chris Cabber's fatal shooting last year in September in South London. In terms of what the Met Police's commissioner has said, he said he's welcomed this review into armed policing and in an open letter to the Home Secretary Yesterday, he said uh, his, it's right that his force is held to the highest standards, but the current system was undermining his officers and suggested they needed more legal protections. And in a statement, the Met have also said some officers were worried about how the Crown Prosecution Service decision uh, to bring a charge impact on them. Of course, what does this mean going forward for those who live in the capital? There will, of course, be questions, particularly when it comes to the numbers and if they'll get the adequate support from other forces as well. So, Theo, um, highly divisive situation. Um, on the one hand, of course, police, backing police is, is the right thing to do. On the other hand, of course, the public may be exposed to an increased terrorist. But a political aspect of this, um, when Mark Rowley said we need to let the police police and Suella Braverman backed him and she was drawn into this political debate. After all, this is a live case and her opponents weren't slow to wade in and criticise her, were they? Well, this is it. We've already heard from some members of the opposition who are questioning whether this is the right thing to do, whether or not uh, the Home Secretary should be coming in at this stage, considering, as you've just said, there's an ongoing case. But, of course, the Home Secretary has said she's going to launch a review. What that means, it's not quite clear yet. There, there's been no specifics, but hopefully that's something uh, she'll provide more clarity on in the next coming days. OK, Theo Combat and News Scotland Yard. Very good to see you this afternoon. Thank you very much. It's very, very difficult, isn't it? It is. I'm going to speak to me now. We will have a good take on this. Get the reaction now. A former police officer, Graham Wetton. Graham, thanks for coming on the live desk. So, yeah, that is the situation. The big talking point now is, on the one hand, of course, police officers showing solidarity towards their, the guy who's been charged here. On the other hand, is this increasing the terror, terror threats to the general public by, by officers putting down their firearms? Well, the Met have now come out and said they've still got an armed response capability within London, albeit it's, it's significantly reduced, but they still have one. There's military support, so that that's been, and that's been in place for some time. It's been cut a practice for some time now that if there is a terror attack, the police can call on the military to support any response to that. So that's almost like half of the course, really. It, it, it's nothing um, different there. If there should be a terror attack on London, there is military capability ready to respond to that and support the armed units that the Met currently have, albeit the Met's uh, armed response units are now significantly reduced because of this action. What do you make, Graham, of, of the right for armed police officers to step back from gun duty? Some comparisons being made on social media this morning, comparing it to strike action, questioning whether that should even be allowed for an armed police officer. What's your take on that? Police officers cannot go on strike legally. This isn't striking because it's not actually part of their part of their core role is to be a police officer. They are volunteers to carry a firearm. You volunteer to do it. You go through some significant training 
and then you're deployed in a row with a piece of kit, which is a firearm. It's the same as if you're doing a police driver course, you're trained to drive police cars in a certain way. So it's part of your policing role. They are still police officers. They have just handed back their firearms um, for their duties because of concerns over the way legal decisions are being made. And this, is, this is, goes back to several other cases as well. It's not just this one specific case, which clearly we cannot discuss the facts around, but this isn't just about one case. This goes down to a lack of leadership and support from the senior managers when, when officers face these sort of situations. It, it comes down to leadership and also a fair and balanced way that officers' actions and decisions are then judged. They just want a, a system that's got integrity and it's fair and balanced to them. It actually takes account of the officers' decisions, their training, their guidance. If they followed that training and guidance, as they are told to do, what then happens to them? It comes down to having confidence in the system, and they clearly haven't got it at the moment, so they are looking at and reviewing their positions, firearms officers. And rightly so, it doesn't just impact on the officers, it also impacts on their families. Do you think, Graham, this is um, brought a broader symptom of... We've seen, for example, um, armed forces, troops from Northern Ireland or Afghanistan being prosecuted for, for historic wrongdoings. And when these cases come to light, there's a feeling very much amongst the armed forces, and no doubt perhaps now the police, that the, the officers or the armed forces uh, in general are kind of thrown to the wolves politically. Um, and this is kind of leaving them to kind of fend for themselves at a time, actually, when the rank-and-file officers just want pure leadership. Yes, it, it, it's similar. It's clearly not the same, but it is a similar sort of case and a similar um, methodology and, and decision making. And actually, all officers want, probably similar in the military, but all they want is their, their leaders to step up and say, mm. we are supporting this individual. While the investigation goes on, they have our backing. If they followed their, if they have followed their training and guidance, they have our full support and backing. We will help them as much as we can within the confines of whatever investigation takes place. I've rarely heard any senior police officer come out and say that in, in many of the recent cases. So that's all they're asking for, some leadership and support, but also to have a system that treats them fairly, that treats them according to everybody else in law. Um, they're not asking to be uh, treated differently or be immune or whatever. They're just asking to have a fair and balanced hearing for the investigation to be done promptly because many of these cases take years to come to court. Mm. That is not fair on the officer, their families, or any victims and families of victims. It, it isn't fair on anybody involved. Mm. These cases take far too long to investigate and come to a conclusion. Well, Sir Mark Rowley has welcomed the Home Office review into armed policing, and he's talked about, uh, well, he suggested the need for more legal protections for armed officers. Is that something that you would support? What kind of legal protections would you like to see in place for armed police officers? I think what he's referencing to there, and the, 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 his letter goes into some like legal technicalities about subjective decisions and objective decisions. I think what he's, what he's referring to there is, Criminal cases are judged on, on beyond all reasonable doubt, whereas civil cases and coroner's inquests go on the balance of probabilities. I think what he's asking for is some more clearly defined legal decisions and any decisions by the CPS or police conduct is based on that beyond all reasonable doubt, not on the balance of probabilities. Because then you're judging police officers on a, on a lower standard than members of the public would be in any sort of similar sort of circumstances. So I think that's what he's, he's almost referring to there. There's a number of factors he refers to in his letter. These have been asked for for years by police officers, including firearms officers. They go back to many other cases where we've asked for these reviews to be conducted. Other commissioners have said they would happen. It hasn't happened so far. This is almost like, finally, we're not having this anymore. This actually needs to come into place now. This review needs to take place. And these, these safeguards, these, these uh, guidance needs to come into play. OK, Graham Wesson, former Met police officer. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us on the live desk. Yeah. It's a tricky one, this, Ali. Really it really tricky. is. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, of course, um, you want solidarity, you want the rank and file to be protected. But the guy's been charged, the case hasn't reached a resolution. Mm -hmm. So some people are saying that the, the action seems um, premature. And then, of course, other people are concerned about the threat to the public. Yeah, of course, those kind of questions are being asked at the moment. It's very, very tricky. Uh, do let us know what you make of this. GBviews at gbnews.com. be really good to, to know your thoughts. Uh, very, very tricky. I couldn't do it. No. And as, as Graham Wetton was just saying there, 
it's voluntary at the moment. It's, uh, it's not part of your duty. You volunteer and you go through a long process and a lot of training in order to hold a weapon. And if those split-second decisions are going to be judged, you know, for, for years to come, you're effectively suspended mm. for, for, for years on the, on the basis of something that you have to make those quick calls like that. And, and the officers are feeling clearly that they're being abandoned by the system and, in fact, they're being vilified for their actions. Yeah, they're calling it a period of reflection. Do let us know what you make of that. GBBs at GBBs news.com but do stay with us because we're going to be live in Lampedusa where more than 11,000 migrants have arrived in the last 10 days from North Africa. Mark White is there. So we'll see you shortly. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. It's a bright Monday for many of us, still some showers around, especially in the north and the west. And it will be windy in the far north, but not as windy as it's expected to be midweek. We've got low pressure to the northwest of the UK. We've got a cold front crossing the country. That's led to fresher but brighter conditions up and down the land. And um, sunshine, actually plenty of sunshine for the east and the south of England. Eastern Scotland seeing some decent sunny spells. But there will be shower clouds elsewhere. One or two showers for Wales and northwest England. But the bulk of the showers affecting western Scotland and Northern Ireland. A brisk wind for many, especially towards the northwest, and feeling on the cool side in the northwest, but still some warmth in the sunshine towards the southeast, 23 Celsius, the afternoon high. Heading into the evening then, and actually many of the showers will disappear. Winds fall light across central and eastern parts with a few mist patches forming by dawn. But at this stage, we've got thickening clouds towards the west, a freshening breeze once again. And it's a relatively mild night in urban areas, but in some rural spots, temperatures dipping into the single figures. A bright start then for many, but from the word go, we've got showers pushing into the central and eastern parts of England. And then this more persistent band of rain moving through Northern Ireland first thing, into Scotland, Northern England. Showery stuff coming into Wales and the southwest. And all of it turns to showers by the end of the afternoon. Highs of 23 Celsius. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps.
From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. The time is 12.24. Now the Home Secretary, Swella Bravman, is set to call on Western leaders to collaborate to tackle the global migrant crisis. It comes as the situation in Europe becomes increasingly desperate as more than 11,000 North African migrants have arrived on Lampedusa over the past 10 days alone. Well, hundreds of police have been deployed to the island to help manage the influx. Let's cross down to Lampedusa and join our home and security editor, Mark White. Hello to you, Mark. So an astonishing situation in Lampedusa when you look at the sheer volume of um, illegals arriving on their shores, 11,000 um, in the last 10 days. And that's a half of what the UK has had the whole year. This is a huge influx. What's the latest? Yeah, it's very significant, and that is double the island's permanent population. Uh, where we are actually is just in the main town centre. Uh, this is Via Roma, uh, which is one of the main streets through the town centre. And we're approaching, of course, the end of the tourist season here. So this uh, main road here, this main street, isn't as busy uh, as it was, but still people out uh, enjoying a coffee and uh, a bite to eat at lunchtime here. Uh, we are not seeing now uh, the significant numbers of uh, African migrants wandering through Lampedusa. Uh, they've been given a bit of relief thanks to these Mistral winds which are blowing through today and out in the Mediterranean making actually the passage uh, pretty difficult for these boats coming across. So that's reduced the number uh, coming to Lampedusa at the moment. Uh, behind me in the main piazza there, uh, you can see some of the uh, banners that have been put up, uh, makeshift uh, banners there, effectively from activist groups saying no borders, migrants welcome. Now, that might be the uh, sentiment that some of the islanders have, but I think the vast majority here are concerned about the sheer numbers that are coming here to Lampedusa. They want this situation redressed. This is what a couple of those tourists said to us a bit earlier. No, it doesn't change uh, the uh, feeling of the island, but uh, I see most uh, military presence of, in, uh, in the island. Concerned about the future, uh, about how it could be, but also a, a bit hopeful because it, it can improve. The situation definitely can improve with the right. <laughs> Well, as we arrived in Lampedusa last night, we actually saw dozens of Italian police officers being flown in from other parts of Italy to help reinforce the officers that are here. Normally, there wouldn't be more than a dozen or so officers uh, to police this tourist resort. But as we filmed at the airport, some of the, these reinforcements coming in, there are now hundreds of officers who are here because we know that when these Mistral winds start to die down, then there will be significant uh, small boat crossings again coming from North Africa to Lampedusa. We should also say that we filmed late last night in an area of the port that we're normally restricted from going to 
during the day, but that gave us, uh, under cover of darkness, the opportunity to see some of these migrant boats. There were dozens of them just all tied up. And just like the Border Force uh, teams do in the UK here, the coastal officials paint on the boats the number, uh, the number of boats that have crossed. And on one boat, I saw 975 stroke 23. So that boat was the 975th boat to cross to Lampedusa in 2023. Now, there may be even more than that, but that just gives you an indication of the number of boats that have crossed from North Africa in recent months. Mark, it's so striking seeing those pictures, almost like a graveyard of boats, small boats there, um, which really is indicative of how big this problem is for that tiny island of Lampedusa, just 20 kilometres squared. It's a, it's a tiny area of land. How are they e even dealing with this? How are they processing that number of people, 11,000 people crossing in just 10 days? Where are these migrants being housed? Well, for a while, they just weren't able to process uh, them properly because they were just overwhelmed. The main processing centre here has a capacity of 400. At one point, there were 11,000 people uh, that had crossed and were uh, crammed into that processing centre. They were climbing over the walls to get out of there. They were in, uh, you know, very... Uh, hot conditions in crammed into this camp. So then they were wandering around the town and that clearly is very worrying uh, to local people as well. Uh, and there were some clashes uh, with Italian police officers at the height of those arrivals. Uh, and as I say, the Mistral winds are blowing at the moment, but they know as soon as that dies down, just as we see in the English Channel, when the weather conditions are good, the boats will come. And people might be wondering, well, this is Lampedusa, uh, an island uh, almost uh, off the coast of Africa. It's so far south. Why does this concern us in the UK? Well, it concerns people in the UK because we know that these people, once they've been processed, will go to the European mainland, to Italy and then on to other countries. And a proportion of these, a significant proportion of uh, those that arrive here, will make their way to the northwest coast of France with a view to trying to get to the UK. Yeah, it's fascinating, Mark, to look overnight. There's been a significant development on that political front. The French interior minister said that France will not take any migrants from Lampedusa. They're saying uh, the primary motive is to try and defend um, Italy's seafaring coast. Of course, that's been a spectacular failure. Giorgia Maloney was elected, of course, on a ticket of stopping the boats. And, in fact, the numbers have doubled from North Africa to 130,000 for this, this year alone compared to the same year. It's almost doubled. So do you get the sense that this is an issue that will be contained within Italy? Or do you fear that the French border will be breached and then they'll be coming through towards the, the Channel Coast, towards Britain? No, this is a Europe-wide crisis, and there are countries within the European Union that are openly rowing, such as France and Germany, openly rowing with Italy, claiming that Italy is not taking its fair share of migrants uh, back uh, from the European Union. So, as a consequence, uh, they are not going to take any of the arrivals from the likes of Lampedusa. It's a clear mess within the European Union. And there are tensions because you have countries on the eastern borders of the European Union, such as Poland and Hungary, who want to do their level best to stop those who are coming in through the West Balkans route. Uh, and then you've got the southern European border states, such as Italy here, such as Spain and Greece, all suffering from a migrant crisis as well. Uh, so it is an existential crisis uh, affecting uh, a number of Europe's uh, borders uh, to the east and to the south.
OK, Mark White live from Lampedusa. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you. We'll be catching up with you later in the show on the live desk. Yeah, and let us know what you make of that story. I mean, as Mark says there, that is a Europe-wide issue, and we are probably going to feel the effects of that influx of people in a few months' time coming across the English channel. GBviews at gbnews.com. There will be lots more to come after the break, including the internal Tory battle over HS2. But first, let's get your headlines with Aaron Armstrong. It is 12.33. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB Newsroom. The Prime Minister says armed police need clarity about their legal protection amid an escalating crisis in the force. Scores of counter-terrorism fire officers have stepped down from their duties after one of their colleagues was charged with murder over the shooting of Chris Cabba in South London last year. Rishi Sunak is backing a Home Office review, which has been ordered to ensure armed police have the confidence to do their job. Uh, cover has been drafted in from neighbouring forces and the military could be used in the event of a terror attack. The mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, believes curtailing the HS2 project risks creating a north-south chasm. The government claims a decision hasn't been taken. Despite mounting speculation, the Birmingham to Manchester leg is to be scrapped amid spiralling costs. The Prime Minister has refused to guarantee the completion of the project but insists he is committed to levelling up. Serial killer Lucy Letby is facing a retrial on the attempted murder of a girl known only as Child K. The former nurse was jailed for life for murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at a hospital in Chester between 2015 and 2016. Jurors were unable to reach a verdict on six further counts of attempted murder. A provisional date has been set for June next year. NHS strikes are thought to have led to the cancellation of more than a million appointments since December. Figures due to be released later are expected to confirm the milestone in the wake of last week's double industrial action by junior doctors and consultants. And you can get more on all of our stories, as always, on our website, gbnews.com. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel...
like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, it's 12.39. Let's have a look at what you've been saying this afternoon on a large number of Met Police counterterrorism firearms officers stepping back from armed duties. We asked you what you made of that, gbviews at gbnews.com, and lots of you getting in touch. Yeah, and Harry says, I don't blame the police officers for handing back their licences. They are damned if they do and damned if they don't. I wouldn't even be a policeman these days, never mind an armed officer. If they do their job and there are any complaints, then they are just hung out to dry. Mm, Brian says the public are more at risk from the striking medical profession than they are from police refusing to carry weapons. Yeah, and Lance says anybody who is willing to attack a police officer are unlikely to hesitate to attack anyone else. If we fail to support armed police, there will soon be anarchy on our streets. Well, do keep your views coming in on that story. It's a very, very difficult mm. one. It is complex. We know you'll have an opinion on it at home, so do let us know what you make of that or any of the stories that we're talking about today, gbviews at gbnews.com. We know you'll have a lot to say about Lampedusa as well mm. and Mark White, who is there for us. We will be going back to Mark White uh, in the next hour as well. To our next story now, Lucy Letby will face a retrial on an outstanding allegation she attempted to murder another baby girl. Well, the former nurse was sentenced to a whole life order for killing seven babies and the attempted murder of six others. But the jury was unable to reach verdicts on six further counts. Well, our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper is outside Manchester Crown Court for us now. Good afternoon to you, Sophie. What's the latest? Good afternoon to you both. Well, we, we heard first this morning from Nick Johnson, KC, who's the prosecutor in this case. He told the courtroom here in Manchester that the prosecution would be seeking a retrial in this case, but so far only on count 14, which relates to the attempted murder of child K. As for the other five counts that were left hung relating to child H, child J, child N and child Q, as it stands, he said, the Crown were not presently seeking a retrial on those particular counts. Now, Justice Goss, who's been the judge presiding over this case since it began last October, he estimated that that retrial would take around two to three weeks. However, he did also say that the next available date for that wouldn't be until at least June 10th of next year. So that date was set provisionally, but there is obviously still quite some time until that date comes around. Now, as for Lucy Letby herself, of course, we now know that uh, she and her legal team have made that application for an appeal, so that is still, of course, ongoing. Uh, we know that for her sentencing last month, she didn't appear here at Manchester Crown Court, but today she did appear via video link from HMP Newhall. Uh, she spoke twice, first to confirm that her name was Lucy Letby, and second to confirm that she could indeed hear and see the court clearly. But that was it. That was the only two occasions we heard from Lucy Letby today. Sophie Reaper, our northwest of England reporter, very good to see you this afternoon. You've been covering that case from day one, so really good to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. OK, on to our next story now. Rishi Sunak has refused to commit to the northern leg of the HS2, but said that he is committed to levelling up. Yes, the Prime Minister wouldn't guarantee the Birmingham to Manchester leg will be completed. He will discuss that further with the Chancellor this week, with the decision expected before the Tory party conference in Manchester next week. 
And the planned line to East Midlands Parkway may also be under threat. Let's cross now to our political editor, Christopher Hope, to find out more. So, Chris, um, a political storm as brewed as you'd expect. Um, George Osborne wading in, calling it a gross act of vandalism. Um, Lord Heseltine wading in, the arch remainer, calling this economic self-harm. But Rishi seems to be standing firm. Uh, that's right. The timing couldn't be worse, could it, Martin and Ellie, given the Tory party conference starts in Manchester later this week on Saturday. And this whole debate is about whether this high-speed rail line should go from Birmingham to, guess where, Manchester. So the timing is really difficult. I've just been to the lobby briefing with the Prime Minister's spokesman. Twice they raised the issue of rephasing. Now, I think rather than axing Birmingham to Manchester altogether, what may see, may, may be the landing zone, if you call that awful uh, Westminster term, they may come up back with, is they rephase it, I delay it till later, till inflation is back under control. But earlier today, the PM, Mr Sunak, was on a visit to Hertfordshire, and he was asked there by reporters about HS2. Here's what we had to say. This kind of speculation that people are you know, making is not right. I mean, we've got spades in the ground, we're getting on and delivering. But across the north, what we're also doing is connecting up all the towns and cities of, uh, in the north, east to west. That's a really important part of how we will create jobs, drive growth across the region, all part of our plans to level up. Free ports are another good example of that, whether that's in Teesside or elsewhere, attracting new investment, new businesses coming in, all good examples of the government levelling up. That was the PM there, Rishi Sunak, defending the levelling up record of the government on a visit to uh, a community centre in Broxbourne where levelling money, levelling up money had been spent. But this, I mean, HS2 really is the almost talismatic project for levelling up. Uh, reports over the weekend it's gone up, gone up by £8 billion. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, knows and says it's been a live issue in, in Parliament, in, in Whitehall right now. And Mr Hunt is back in London, as is Rishi Sunak. We, we are expecting some news this week. But I must say and be clear, the government has not said anything will, will come. But I doubt they can go into this party conference on a political level with this uncertainty hanging over HS2 this weekend. Has always been clear, hasn't he, about the way he would prioritise levelling up. So it does seem that scrapping the Manchester leg of HS2, it does hold political risks for Rishi Sunak, doesn't it? I think so, uh, hugely, and he understands the value of it. Of course, he's the MP for Richmond in Yorkshire. He, he um, is an MP for the north of England. He knows how important it is. And we've heard, haven't we, over the last few days from Andy Burnham, the Greater Manchester Mayor. Unusually, we're having uh, reported briefings from former Prime Minister David Cameron, who started off the idea in the first place, Boris Johnson, another uh, former Prime Minister. And so it, there was a big debate developing. And I just wonder the, whether the idea of rephasing it slightly delaying elements of it rather than cancelling it altogether is where this landing zone might be. Mm. OK, and Christopher, uh, more storm on the horizon for Rishi. Phones for you. Founder John Caldwell um, said he can no longer in good conscience donate to the Tory party because of Rishi's rowing back on net zero. Will that have an impact or do you think there may be other donors out there who are quite happy about Rishi's new position who might donate instead? Well, I mean, uh, uh, John Caldwell, of course, it has denoted in the past, and he has talked about his views in the past, but I, the PM can't really be swayed by this. This is money going to the Tory, Tory coppers for the election, nothing to do with government spending. But there will be a debate. There will be certainly will be business leaders up, up north in the north of England who want to have this connection. Don't forget, the idea of Ages 2 was, sp was originally, originally spun out to us as one of speed. It's now one of capacity. So the idea is if you have this extra line uh, almost shadowing the West Coast main line, you can have more stops on the West Coast mainline route and have a faster point-to-point -point route from Bur London, Birmingham and beyond. That's the idea of it. Um, I think plenty of companies may think that's a good idea, but, the, but I think John Cordwell, it, it just shows the debate there is around this. I think um, it, it'd be quite a lot of explaining to do if they do get rid of it altogether. That's why I think it probably won't happen. Chris Hope, what's your response to Tory grandees coming out to criticise Sunak about this rowing back on HS2 quite so publicly? You can understand why they might do that. Obviously, it's, it's their idea in the, in the first place, uh, some of them. But to do so so publicly in this time of, of approaching a general election, yeah. it could be very damaging, couldn't it? Mm. 
Well, certainly, and there is this, this debate, isn't there, at the heart of the Tory party? Don't forget the most recent um, political uh, sort of you know HR move the PM did was when he got um, Ben Wallace, the yeah, MP for, for Lancashire, left the government, and three Southern MPs entered the government or, or, or were promoted uh, to the top team. Claire Cortinier being the obvious one. Um, I think there's, an, there's, a, there's a slight issue here. I think with Mr Sunak, does he actually support this idea of red wall? The, the, those MPs, those uh, those MPs, so so vigorously won by Boris Johnson back in the 2019 general election. He's got to do more to show he does care for the North. Of course, he's the MP for Richmond in Yorkshire. We know that. But w what will he do? He's got to show levelling up is more than just warm words. People talk rightly about linking better Liverpool, Manchester, Hull on the east coast of, 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 of England. And that's the kind of thing people want to see. And, and whether mm -hmm. they look at doing more spending in that space and, and, and down, down and, and rephasing, as I say, HS2, that could be where it goes. But it's not helpful having all these noises off when the PM is trying to get himself back on the front foot with long term planning, as we saw last week on Net Zero. OK, Chris Hope, in our new Westminster studio, very good to see you this afternoon. Thank you so, so much. So interesting what Chris Hope was saying there about perhaps an alternative option, because we were speaking to our makeup artist a little bit earlier on, <laughs> and she's from York, isn't yeah. she? And we're ha having this conversation with her about HS2. She didn't really care about mm. HS2 in terms of coming down to London. She said the service from York is quite good. It's that M62 corridor, what Chris Hope was just talking about there, Liverpool and Leeds and, and out to Hull, that's what... Many people up north would like to see. That's what she was telling us. Well, they call it the highway to Hull. That road the is, 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 is to literally Hull. a motorway that stops at Hull. It takes an eternity to get across the country. And I, I, I wonder if people care about saving 10 minutes, shaving off 10 yeah. minutes on a journey to London. The entire transport policy seems to be so London metropolitan centric. Um, they want to make journeys quicker uh, to London quicker and then tell us to stop driving our cars because we're, we're sort of damaging the planet. Yeah. Meanwhile, people just need to get around and save a few quid. So perhaps you would like to see an alternative rather than HS2 down to London. Do let us know what, what you make of that. What would, what would you do if you were in charge? GBviews at gbnews.com. We do love to hear from you. We do. Now, moving on to our next story. North Yorkshire Police has become one of the latest forces to deploy a specialist team of officers in York's nighttime economy to help prevent sexual offences and to keep people safe. Well, our reporter Anna Riley joined officers from Project Vigilant on patrol during Freshers' Week to see how they plan to regain control. Welcome to the Project Vigilant briefing. Um, today we're going to be doing a combination of uniformed patrols and uh, plainclothes officers. All right? We're going to go out in our nighttime economy and we're going to try and identify any people who are displaying signs of predatory sexual behaviour. Fully briefed, Project Vigilant officers head out into York's nightlife. Evening. Their aim, to stop sexual violence before it happens. It's University Freshers Week and patrols are focused on designated areas of the city. It fits in with our, strat our violence against women and girls strategy, our Vogue strategy really. And it, this, this project just adds another layer of protective policing that we can offer for the public to be there to, to ensure that if sexual violence is happening in a nighttime economy, then we, then we need to be one step ahead of it and we need to try and prevent it. With York a tourist city, filled with residents and visitors day and night, this operation looks out for those who can become more vulnerable as the evening wears on. So I'm leading the, the plainclothes officers um, and we're looking for any suspicious behaviour, people that might be reacting oddly to the presence of uniformed police officers um, and any vulnerable people that might be um, that might be around, so that might be, they might be vulnerable due to the amount of alcohol they've drunk um, or vulnerable situations, they might be attached from friends, things like that. So that's who we're looking for to prevent any offences uh, and to protect those people. As well as protecting revellers, the operation also supports those who work in pubs and clubs. After the Covid, all, all the lockdowns, generally the entertainment side of it has suffered you know, big time. It's just starting to get going again now, really. So I, I think it's a massive help. If you've got people that are possibly out and about to maybe you know, do a little bit of mystery, if just seeing them, it, it, it just takes it down. As the clock ticks on, just how safe do people feel in the city? I was spiked before at home in Hull. Uh, it was a horrible experience, but 
now that I'm in York, I'm kind of thinking, oh, it won't happen to me, hoping so. I do see the police, I do feel a lot safer whenever they're around, or like even just ambulances or something like that. I never felt bad just walk, like walking home at like four, three, it's, it's always quite safe. Fairly safe, I think it's, it's quite a nice city in terms of like, there's enough places to go in a night out, but it's not like too busy. I feel quite safe in York because it's quite small. Um, like kind of know a lot of people as well. I've only been here three weeks and I've gone for a few nights out. The police officers around here are brilliant. The bouncers around here are absolutely excellent. Really easy to get on with, but you'll see them go in. If anyone's messing around, they'll take them out straight away. Multiple people were stopped and questioned by police throughout the evening, but no arrests were made. As much as Project Vigilant is about proactive policing, it's also to ensure vulnerable people weren't alone and could get home safely. Anna Riley, GB News, York. Well, I really like the look of that, actually. I think that would make me feel really safe. I think it's superb. But see, that's the sort of policing I think people want. You know, stop policing tweets and police the streets. Get on, mm. get out there at the times when people are in danger, especially women, especially women on their own. Mm -hmm. Have a force. Bobby's on the beat, boots on the ground. It works. Well, I think for a lot, of, a lot of people, especially talking of myself as a woman in the early hours, it's the visibility of yeah. police that makes me feel safe. They don't even necessarily need to talk to you or, or help you in a hands-on way yeah. but just being there outside of a club or outside of a bar you know that should anything happen you're in safe hands yeah they did that in my home city of nottingham a couple of years back there are more police than punters in the market oh, really? square at night yeah but it worked because well, well and actually people were chatting to the coppers they, they were they were having it was great for community relationships yeah, that's that true. is the sort of thing that people really really would yeah. like to see more of and i think for men as well men who some men who would have the tendency to perhaps have a scrap outside of a bar or a club yeah. just having the police there would prevent that as well so uh, it's a positive from us let us know what you think gbviews at gbnews.com but do stay with us plenty more to come in the next hour of course we'll return to our main story which is that a significant number of counter-terrorism firearms officers have stepped back from armed duties see you shortly the temperatures rising boxed solar proud sponsors of weather on gb news Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. It's a bright Monday for many of us, still some showers around, especially in the north and the west. And it will be windy in the far north, but not as windy as it's expected to be midweek. We've got low pressure to the northwest of the UK. We've got a cold front crossing the country. That's led to fresher but brighter conditions up and down the land. And um, sunshine, actually plenty of sunshine for the east and the south of England. Eastern Scotland seeing some decent sunny spells. But there will be shower clouds elsewhere. One or two showers for Wales and northwest England. But the bulk of the showers affecting western Scotland and Northern Ireland. A brisk wind for many, especially towards the northwest, and feeling on the cool side in the northwest, but still some warmth in the sunshine towards the southeast, 23 Celsius, the afternoon high. Heading into the evening then, and actually many of the showers will disappear. Winds fall light across central and eastern parts with a few mist patches forming by dawn. But at this stage, we've got thickening clouds towards the west, a freshening breeze once again. And it's a relatively mild night in urban areas, but in some rural spots, temperatures dipping into the single figures. A bright start then for many, but from the word go, we've got showers pushing into the central and eastern parts of England. And then this more persistent band of rain moving through Northern Ireland first thing, into Scotland, Northern England. Showery stuff coming into Wales and the southwest. And all of it turns to showers by the end of the afternoon. Highs of 23 Celsius. The temperature's rising. Boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching.
Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, it's 1pm and you're with the live desk here on GB News with myself, Martin, and Ellie Costello coming up this Monday lunchtime. GB News is told that a significant number of counter-terrorism firearms officers have stepped back from armed duties. Commanders are now in crisis meetings with the military on standby to respond to any serious incidents in the capital. We're live from Scotland Yard. And more than 11,000 migrants have arrived in Lampedusa from North Africa in the past 10 days alone. Our Home Affairs and Security Editor Mark White is live on the island. And Rishi Sunak refuses to confirm whether HS2 will continue past Birmingham, with former Chancellor George Osborne saying the move would be an act of huge economic self-harm. We'll have all the latest reaction from Westminster. Plus, who'd be a Sheffield United fan? The poor old Blades got hammered yesterday. We'll discuss how it feels when your team loses eight. That's not a mistake. Eight nil. But first, here's your headlines with Aaron Armstrong. <laughs> Good afternoon to you. It's a minute past one. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The Prime Minister says armed police deserve the gratitude of the public but need clarity over their legal protection. A significant number of counter-terrorism officers in London have stepped back from firearm duties after a colleague was charged with the murder of the shooting of Chris Caba in South London last year. And number 10 says it's important not to delay a Home Office review into armed police guidance. The military has been put on standby to respond in the event of a terror attack. The Shadow Paymaster General, Jonathan Ashworth, says people need confidence in the police. It's vital that they, that they have support, but there are also safeguards in place. Now, there's been a, a review announced by the Home Secretary. We don't know the details of that review yet. There's also that live 
uh, prosecution, that court case. So I want, to be, I want, as a politician, to be careful about how I comment on these matters, as you would, as you would appreciate. But we obviously need to make sure we have uh, procedures in place which commands the confidence of both the police officers and the communities they serve. Well, meanwhile, the mayor of Greater Manchester says the North shouldn't have to pay for the government's mismanagement of HS2. Rishi Sunak is refusing to guarantee the Manchester leg will be completed, with a decision expected to be announced before the Tory party conference in the city next week. While Andy Burnham says curtailing the project represents the opposite of levelling up. But the Prime Minister insists he's committed to the long-term Tory pledge. This kind of speculation that people are you know, making is not right. I mean, we've got spades in the ground, we're getting on and delivering. But across the north, what we're also doing is connecting up all the towns and cities of, uh, in the north, east to west. That's a really important part of how we will create jobs, drive growth across the region, all part of our plans to level up. Free ports are another good example of that, whether that's in Teesside or elsewhere, attracting new investment, new businesses coming in, all good examples of the government levelling up. The Home Secretary will call for unity amongst Western leaders to combat the global migration crisis. Suella Braverman will tell an audience in Washington other countries can learn from the UK's innovative attempts to tackle illegal migrants. She's questioning whether conventions and legal frameworks designed more than 50 years ago are still fit for purpose and would like a shake-up of international rules. Around one million NHS appointments have been cancelled since December because of strikes in England. Last week's industrial action by junior doctors and consultants has meant the country will reach the milestone in the figures set to be announced today. Another double strike is scheduled for next week. The organisation's deputy chief executive, Saffron Cordery, has labelled it damaging and demoralising. Meanwhile, almost 400,000 patients in England waited 24 hours or more in A&E last year. The Royal College of Emergency Medicines calling the situation a matter of national shame. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting says 24 hours in A&E is no longer just a documentary, but the Department of Health and Social Care claims improvements are being made through the NHS recovery plan. Prosecutors uh, are seeking a retrial of Lucy Letby uh, on one count of attempted murder. The former nurse was jailed for life last month for the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of six others at a hospital in Chester in 2015 and 2016. Uh, jurors were unable to reach a verdict on six further counts of attempted murder. Uh, the retrial is likely to take place in June next year on count 14 only, which relates to the attempted murder of child K. Lucy Letby denies all charges and has launched an appeal. Experts are warning the government will not meet its manifesto pledge to end homelessness by next year. The Kerslake Commission says there are chronic and unresolved issues in the housing system, with a crisis pushing more people onto the streets. The number of people sleeping rough last autumn was some 25% higher than at the same time three years ago. The government says it's spending £2 billion to end rough sleeping for good. Police searching for a missing mother have arrested a 31-year-old woman who attended an East London police station. The woman was also taken to hospital as a precaution. Two children, reported missing from a centre for vulnerable mothers and children in London, were found safe and well in Harwich earlier today. Officers had been looking for 31-year-old Jamie Lee Kelly, who left the facility on Tuesday with her three-year-old daughter and newborn baby boy. This is GB News. We're in your car, on your TV and on your smart speaker to just say play GB News. That's it from me. Now over to Martinelli. It's six minutes past one. Let's have a look at what you think about the Prime Minister refusing to confirm that the Manchester leg of HS2 will be built. And do remember, you can get in touch as well, gbviews at gbnews.com. Well, Les says, I think that HS2 has been and still is a white elephant. That's the term you used earlier, That's isn't right, it? Yep. Uh, the government have been talking about improving rail travel and building HS2 on the pretext of increasing passenger capacity and reliability. 
But it's been reported to have gone way over budget for long enough. Would it not be wise to cut our losses and invest in the existing rail infrastructure? Let us common sense will never catch on. Alison says, I would have started building a new railway from the north down. So if you run out of money, at least the north would have something. That's Good point. A very interesting point, yes. Chris says, I would scrap HS2 and transfer the projected HS2 cost to turning back the boats and putting bobbies on the beat to stop shoplifting. Mm. Really interesting views. Do keep them coming in to us this afternoon. On any of the stories that we're talking about this afternoon, gbviews at gbnews.com. Yeah, I'm always grabbed by the fact that GB News viewers have got far more common sense than anybody who's running the country. So please keep them coming in. Maybe you should be in charge. <laughs> That's what we'd like to see. I do love the views, though, because things like that, such as starting in the north and coming yeah. down, what a great idea. It would never occur to the yeah. politicians. Well. Let's move on to our next story. GB News has learnt a large number of Met Police counter-terrorism firearms officers have stepped back from armed duties, with almost all armed response vehicles in London opting for a period of reflection. Yes, senior Met commanders are in talks to ensure the capital has an adequate response to firearms incidents, whilst the military is on standby in the event of a terrorist attack. And it follows the CPS last week charging a Met firearms officer with murder over the shooting of an unarmed black man, Chris Cabber, in South London. Well, GB News' national reporter Theo Jacomba is at Scotland Yard for us now. Good afternoon to you, Theo. This is significant, isn't it? It is indeed. Well, the Metropolitan Police's Firearms Command is up against a difficult situation following a large number of them handing in their tickets, which is essentially a licence which allows them to carry out their duties in their role. Now, we do understand the Home Secretary has launched a review into um, armed policing and has spoken to the Met's uh, commissioner about this situation after they said they are stepping back. Now, the officers protesting are saying that they're doing this as they feel that they don't have enough support, particularly in the case that's currently happening at the moment. Their colleague last week uh, was charged uh, with murder following the fatal shooting of Chris Cabot in September 2022. Now, of course, there are questions. What does this mean overall about the safety of those in London, particularly if there are high-profile cases in the next, whenever that could happen? Um, are there adequate uh, police uh, or specialist officers in place for that? We do understand, though, that the SAS uh, will be there to help if needed. It's worth mentioning that they won't be patrolling around London, but they will be called upon when needed. And there are some other forces which have been contacted uh, to come and help should uh, they be needed. Now, we've heard from the Prime Minister earlier today in response to this situation and what the Home Secretary has said, and this is what he had to say. Well, our firearms officers do uh, an incredibly difficult job. They're making life or death decisions in a split second to keep us safe, and they deserve our gratitude for their bravery. Now, it's important when they're using these legal powers uh, that they do so with clarity uh, and they have certainty about what they're doing, especially given the lethality that they are using. Uh, that's why the Home Secretary's asked her department to review the guidance that the officers are operating under. Now, the Home Secretary has offered a message of support, particularly those officers who feel that they may end up in a situation like this, being afraid to potentially end up in the dock should they have to use um, their uh, firearms. Now, we know that they might find themselves in a situation which happens quite quickly and it leads into this situation. We've also heard from the Met's uh, commissioner and he was saying in an open letter to the Home Secretary that it was right that his force was held to the highest standard but the highest, the, the current system should I say, was undermining his officers and suggested they needed more legal protections. But as we've mentioned before, there are still questions, what does this mean and will they get adequate support and of course how, fe how people feel here in the Capital. Okay, Theo Chikomba, live from Scotland Yard. Thank you for that latest update. Now, Rishi Sunak has refused to commit to the northern leg of HS2, but says he is committed to levelling up. The Prime Minister wouldn't guarantee the Birmingham to Manchester leg will be completed, and he'll discuss its future with the Chancellor this week, with a decision expected before the Tory party conference going to 
Yep, Manchester next week. Well, joining us now is the MP for Crewe and Nantwich, Kieran Mullen. Very good to see you this afternoon, Mr Mullen. And you are the MP for Crewe and Nantwich, so you are directly affected by this if that, that leg of HS2 does not go ahead. Well, you must be furious at that prospect. Well, I recognise that you know, we're in difficult economic times and, and, of course, it's right that the Chancellor Prime Minister look at all of the government's spending, but I'm passionate about the difference that I think HS2 can make, not just to crew, but actually to all of the North West. And it's really about tackling this issue of levelling up, and that's the problem with the fact that London dominates our economy. And actually, post-pandemic, we've seen London bounce back more strongly and quicker than the rest of the country. So that's only going to get worse unless we can really make a seismic change to how we live, work in, in the rest of the country, particularly where I'm up in the northwest. Karen, yeah, what would you say to people who's, who, who point out with, with some justification that this leg was going to be 23 billion quid? And I think it would shave off 45 minutes from a journey from Crewe to London. That's two billion pounds a minute. Now, there's much better ways of spending that money, as you quite rightly say, on levelling up the country east to west and not being quite so London-centric. However, um, it's not going to be very easy for you, is it? Um, your constituents must be furious. So... Of course, we should be looking at whether we can spend this money effectively on the route. And I've never objected to that. And I think we as a country need to get better at major infrastructure projects. But, you know, are we really saying that there isn't a cost effective way to, to build a new railway track in the UK, the home of the home of the railways? And I think one of the big misunderstandings about HS2 is it's not just about journey times, it's about actually capacity. So the West Coast Main Line is the busiest mixed-use mix railway line in all of Europe. And so it means that actually local journeys that my constituents want to make on that railway line are competing with that busy traffic between the big cities. So actually when we move that city traffic onto HS2, there's going to be more connections, more journeys locally that my constituents can use. And actually, yes, of course, Northern Powerhouse Rail, the East-West connections are important. But I'm not sure why we should be having to make a choice between the two. You know, in London, there isn't a choice between tubes and trains and buses. All those things get invested in. And I think we should be expecting the same in the north. So would you like to see an alternative to HS2, a rail alternative? I want to see a new railway connection between my constituency in Crewe and Nantwich and Manchester and Birmingham and London, because I know the difference that's going to make. Let's say that you're growing up in Crewe, you finish college, you love Crewe, you like living in a, in a smaller town with your friends and family. At the minute, it's so difficult for you to get the jobs and opportunities without making a move to somewhere like Manchester or Birmingham or London. If we would cut those journey times down, make them more frequent. So actually, let's say you want to get a job in Birmingham, cut that down from around an hour to less than half an hour, my constituents can stay living in Crewe, stay spending their money in Crewe and contributing to it locally, but have that job in Birmingham. And entrepreneurs can do the same and businesses can do the same. And that's the whole idea, really. What we're doing is breaking down that silo between London and the rest of the country. Now, Kieran, um, the Labour Party have weighed that in, saying that they will keep HS2. Um, you'd expect that. Uh, but how unhelpful is it that people like Boris Johnson have been wading in, saying that this is a mutilated version of HS2? George Osborne, he's resurfaced again, saying this is a gross act of vandalism. And Lord Heseltine, never short of a word or two to attack a Brexiteer, um, saying that this is economic self-harm. You're about to go to Manchester for your own Tory party conference. How unhelpful is it for these political figures from the past to be steaming into Rishi? Well, that might not be the words I would use, but I just think all of those individuals are as passionate as I am about what HS2 can deliver for, for the North, for Manchester, for Crewe, for Birmingham. And so I understand why they're frustrated. I mean, Labour, you've heard more than me then, because I can't actually get a straight answer out of them whether they're going to support it or not. And of course, we know Keir Star was fully opposed to it, but he flip-flops on every single issue going. So, you know, and our track record when it comes to rail in the North and Labour is appalling. When they were last in, the Northern Rail franchise, they rented that out on a zero investment basis. The whole time they were in government, they electrified 63 miles of railway. We've done more than 1,000. So I'm proud of our track record. That doesn't mean I'm not passionate about what I think HS2 can deliver for the North and the Midlands. You must have fears, though. You must have concerns in, in an, an era now where we're entering into a, a general election. It hasn't been called yet, but we all know it's on the cards probably uh, this time next year. What do you think it will mean for Rishi Sunak? What do you think it will mean for your party if you abandon this part of, of HS2, especially for the Red Wall and Northern voters who want to see levelling up in action? 
Well, I think you're right. I think that, that 29 v, 2019 voters and, and before, actually, I think people were moving to our party because they didn't think that Labour was delivering for them in the regions. And I want us to deliver. And don't get me wrong, there are things that we're doing, for example, in my constituency. We've got something called a town deal, which brings in investment to the area. And we've seen levelling up funds and other things that the government are doing to invest and try and tackle this levelling up issue. I just happen to think that one of the best ways of doing that is, is HS2 and that it's, it's, you know, on track. We're doing it. We're building it as we speak. It's been through planning. It's been through Parliament a lot of it already. Other options, I would be wary about changing horse mid-race because actually we know this one is already making a difference in places like Birmingham. Speak to the mayor, Andy Street, Conservative mayor. He's clear it's bringing huge amounts of investment to Birmingham and it's not even arrived yet. Yeah, well, politicians are one thing. I, I campaigned across the West Midlands. I didn't meet a single person who wanted HS2, apart from people who worked in business. Members of the public would much rather get a decent bus service around their constituency. And the idea I keep coming back to, I'm afraid I need to reiterate, it does feel like it's all about saving time for people getting to London, who seem to get all the best baubles anyway with the Elizabeth line, with the overground. Isn't it just time to accept reality? Kieran, we're a £2.6 trillion in national debt. The HS2 project is the ultimate how long is a piece of string white elephant project. £100 billion and rising. It's simply time to call time on HS2. I mean, that accepts the premise that we, as the home of the railways, can't build an affordable railway. And I just don't accept that. So if we want to look at what's going on as to why those costs have gone up, and what we can do, whether it's in planning or whatever it might be, to get those costs down. But I don't accept that we can't build an affordable new railway line in this country. So I, I think also to keep in mind, yes, that sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but this is a project that's going to be spent over 15 years. So actually on a year-by-year -year basis, we're spending more on the rest of the railway than we are on HS2, and it's going to last for decades and decades. And let, let's remember the original high-speed rail, that the, the Euro Tunnel, 80% overspend, lots of challenges getting done, but I don't think you or any of your viewers would say that we should never should have spent that money. And, and that's true, for example, of Crossrail in London. A lot of criticism, a lot of concerns, but it's now an integral part of the network. So let's focus on costs. Let's see where we can drive them down further, but let's not abandon the idea that the UK can't build a new railway line in an affordable way. OK, Kieran Mullen, MP for Crew and Nanthwich, thank you for that impassioned defence of HS2. Appreciate it. Yeah, Thank really you. good to hear from Kieran Mullen there. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you're in the northwest. What do you make of this plan? Mm. Uh, it hasn't yet been confirmed by Rishi Sunak, but lots of criticism from Tory Grandees um, coming out to criticise Sunak if he were uh, to ditch that leg of HS2. Let us know what you make of that. Would you like to see an alternative? Would you like to see a Liverpool to Hull route? Would you, would you like to see a better bus route? Do let us know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.com. Or even any bus route. I mean, a lot of places have got like one bus a day or one, one bus an hour if you're, no, if you're, oh, yeah. if you're looking. It costs six, seven, eight quid just to go a few miles. I just think people want something that sort supports them locally, not just getting to and from London quicker. Mm. I could be wrong. Let us know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.com. But do stay with us. When we come back, a retrial for former nurse Lucy Letby. We'll have all the latest details with Sophie Reaper. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. I'm Craig Snell. Well, looking ahead to the next few days, we will see some sunnier and brighter moments, but uh, watch out for Wednesday. Could turn very windy for some of us. Back to the here and now. Lots of sunshine out there, actually, across parts of England and Wales. Still maybe a little bit of overnight rain and cloud just to clear the very far southeast. But for most of us, really, it's a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the main bulk of the showers, and some of these could potentially be quite heavy, maybe even the odd rumble of thunder. And still quite windy here. That will temper the temperatures somewhat. But down towards the southeast, feeling quite warm. Highs reaching 22 or 23 degrees. Into the evening, a lot of England and Wales remaining dry. Still the risk of some showers across Northern Ireland and Scotland, especially across more western areas. Elsewhere, under the clear skies, we could see some mist and fog also forming. And then later on in the night, just starting to potentially see some heavy showers working in across the very far south coast of England. A mild night for all of us, temperatures staying firmly in double figures. So these showers will then track their way northwards across parts of England as we go through the course of the morning. Elsewhere, once any early mist and fog clears, briefly drier and brighter, but then further bands of rain moving in from the west, which will be accompanied again by some fairly strong winds, heaviest of the rain for Scotland and Northern Ireland. But despite the wind, it's going to be another fairly mild one. Temperatures high teens in the north, low 20s in the south.
The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. News Channel. Uh, welcome back to the live desk. It's 25 past one. Now, Lucy Letby will face a retrial on an outstanding allegation she attempted to murder another baby girl. Yes, the former nurse was sentenced to a whole life order for killing seven babies and the attempted murder of six others. But the jury was unable to reach verdicts on six further counts. Well, our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper is outside Manchester Crown Court for us now. And Sophie, you've been in the courtroom this morning. What's the latest? Well, good afternoon to you both. Yes, we've been in here at Manchester Crown Court this morning waiting to hear that decision from the Crown Prosecution Service. We did hear from the prosecution. They told us they would be seeking a retrial. However, it would only be on count 14 as it stands. That charge, of course, relating to the attempted murder of child K. As for the other five counts that were left hung at the end of August when a jury were unable to come to a verdict one way or another, 
those five counts, the prosecution said that as it stands, the Crown is not presently seeking a retrial on those particular counts. Now, Justice Goss, who's been the judge presiding over this case since it began all the way back in October of last year, he told the courtroom this morning that that retrial relating to child care, he estimated it would take around two to three weeks. However, he also said that it could, it, it, the next available date possible wouldn't be until at least June 10th of next year. So that date was set provisionally. However, of course, it is still quite some way away, so things could potentially change uh, before then. Lucy Letby, uh, as it stands, uh, she didn't appear for her sentencing back in August of last year here at Manchester Crown Court, but she did appear here today uh, via video link from HMP New Hall. Uh, she spoke twice, first to confirm uh, her name and second to confirm that she could hear and see the courtroom clearly. But that was it. That was all we heard today from Lucy Letby. Of course, we also know now that she and her legal team have launched that application uh, for an appeal against those guilty convictions. So that is also ongoing. That's with the Court of Appeals now. But we know that it could be at least five months before that scene before a judge. So these things are incredibly complex and they do take quite some time. So although we may have thought back in August that this Lucy Letby trial was starting to wind down, what with both of these things and the statutory inquiry, it does seem that it's going to now rumble on for still quite some time. I'm afraid it does. Thank you very much, Sophie Reaper there at Manchester Crown Court for us this afternoon. Thank you. Moving on to our next story now. North Yorkshire Police has become one of the latest forces to deploy a specialist team of officers in York's late-night economy to help prevent sexual offences and keep people safe. Well, our reporter Anna Riley joined officers from Project Vigilant on patrol during Freshers' Week to see how they plan to regain control. Welcome to the Project Vigilant briefing. Um, today we're going to be doing a combination of uniformed patrols and uh, plainclothes officers. All right? We're going to go out in our nighttime economy and we're going to try and identify any people who are displaying signs of predatory sexual behaviour. Fully briefed, Project Vigilant officers head out into York's nightlife. Evening. Their aim, to stop sexual violence before it happens. It's University Freshers' Week and patrols are focused on designated areas of the city. It fits in with our, strat with our violence against women and girls strategy, our Vogue strategy really. And it, this, this project just adds another layer of protective policing that we can offer for the public to be there to, to ensure that if sexual violence is happening in a nighttime economy, then we, then we need to be one step ahead of it and we need to try and prevent it. With York a tourist city, filled with residents and visitors day and night, this operation looks out for those who can become more vulnerable as the evening wears on. So I'm leading the, the plainclothes officers um, and we're looking for any suspicious behaviour, people that might be reacting oddly to the presence of uniformed police officers um, and any vulnerable people that might be um, that might be around, so that might be, they might be vulnerable due to the amount of alcohol they've drunk um, or vulnerable situations, they might be attached from friends, things like that. So that's who we're looking for to prevent any offences uh, and to protect those people. As well as protecting revellers, the operation also supports those who work in pubs and clubs. After the Covid, all, all the lockdowns, generally the entertainment side of it has suffered you know, big time. It's just starting to get going again now, really. So I, I think it's a massive help. If you've got people that are possibly out and about to maybe you know, do a little bit of mystery, if just seeing them, it, it, it just takes it down. As the clock ticks on, just how safe do people feel in the city? I was spiked before at home in Hull. Uh, it was a horrible experience, but... Now that I'm in York, I'm kind of thinking, oh, it won't happen to me, hoping so. I do see the police, I do feel a lot safer whenever they're around, or like even just ambulances or something like that. I never felt bad just walk, like walking home at like four, three, it's, it's always quite safe. Fairly safe, I think it's, it's quite a nice city in terms of like, there's enough places to go in a night out, but it's not like too busy. I feel quite safe in York, because it's quite small. Um, I kind of know a lot of people as well. I've only been here three weeks and I've gone for a few nights out. The police officers around here are brilliant. The bouncers around here are absolutely excellent. Really easy to get on with, but you'll see them go in. If anyone's messing around, they'll take them out straight away. Multiple people were stopped and questioned by police throughout the evening, but no arrests were made. 
As much as Project Vigilant is about proactive policing, it's also to ensure vulnerable people weren't alone and could get home safely. Anna Riley, GB News, York. Looks like a superb initiative. That's the sort of thing I think people want to see. You know, policing the streets, not policing tweets. Actually making people feel safe when they're most needed late at night. Yeah, I think it's a really positive mm. thing. I think the visibility of mm. police in the early hours of the morning when you're coming out of a nightclub or a bar, it counts for a lot. You yeah. just feel safer, don't you, with, it, with them around. Let us know what you think of that as an idea. Is that something you'd like to see in your local town? GBviews at gbnews.com. And still to come, we are live in Lampedusa, where thousands of migrants have arrived in the last week. 11,000, actually. But first, here's your news headlines with Aaron. It's 1.32. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The Prime Minister says armed police need clarity about their legal protection amid an escalating crisis. Scores of counter-terrorism firearms officers have stepped down from their duties after a colleague was charged with murder of the shooting of Chris Caba in South London last year. Rishi Sunak is backing a Home Office review, which has been ordered to ensure armed police have the confidence to do their job. Cover's been drafted in from neighbouring forces and the military could be used in the event of a terror attack. Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, uh, warns that curtailing the HS2 project risks creating a north-south chasm. The government claims the decision hasn't yet been taken. Despite mounting speculation, the Birmingham to Manchester leg is to be scrapped amid spiralling costs. The Prime Minister has refused to guarantee the completion of the project, but insists he is committed to levelling up. Serial killer Lucy Letby is facing a retrial on the attempted murder of a girl known only as Child K. The former nurse was jailed for life for murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at a hospital in Chester between 2015 and 2016. Jurors were unable to reach a verdict on six further counts of attempted murder. A provisional date has been set for June next year. NHS strikes are thought to have led to the cancellation of more than a million appointments since December. The figures, due to be released later, are expected to confirm the milestone in the wake of last week's double strike action by junior doctors and consultants. I'll be back with more at the top of the next hour, or there's more now on our website, gbnews.com. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. And here's a quick look at the markets today. The pound buys you $1.2224 and €1.1497. The price of gold, £1,574.45 per ounce. The FTSE 100 is at 7,620 points. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for physical investment. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 pm, Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB, on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. I just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Channel. Welcome back to the Live Desk with Ellie and Martin. It's 1.38. Now, let's have a look at some of your views. Don't forget, you can email us anytime, gbviews at gbnews.com. What are saying, Els? Well, Jason says HS2 is proving to be the final nail for, governments, for the government, with such prominent Tory MPs and former Cabinet members speaking so strongly against him. He says, I can see a mutiny taking Rishi Sunak down. Mm. Sarah says this, the audacity of Suella Braverman to say she wants Western leaders to unite in the face of the European migration crisis. Her government has failed at every step to stop the boats, despite it being one of Sunak's key pledges. I thought that when she was saying this morning, oh, people could learn from our innovative approach. I thought, well, what? Yeah, yeah, difficult one. It's very interesting, actually. We are going to speak, we hope, uh, to an Italian yes. journalist a little bit later on. And it's so interesting mm. because the rhetoric here has been we're going to stop the boats. Obviously, uh, as we just heard, they're one of Rishi Sunak's five key pledges. Well, it's the same rhetoric in Italy. Yeah, and... And, and their Prime Minister is saying she's going to stop the boats. And, indeed, that has not happened either. They've had 11,000 right. migrants cross in the last 10 days alone. So it does go to show, we were talking about this in the break, weren't we, that you always think it's our problem. But actually, you'll find it's a Europe-wide problem. Yeah, it's be... affecting so many different countries across Europe right now. That's right, because what ends up on Italy's shores will surely make its way through France, through open borders, and then onto the Channel Coast and coming our way soon. Yeah. Well, Graham's been in touch as well. Good afternoon to you, Graham, who says, I never thought I would say this, but it's time for a Labour government. Nurses on strike, doctors on strike, and now armed police officers on strike. Give Starmer a go. It can't get much worse. Well, do keep those views coming in. GBviews at gbnews.com. OK, moving on to that story. Home Secretary Suella Braverman is set to call on Western leaders to collaborate to tackle the global migrant crisis. Well, it comes as the situation in Europe becomes increasingly desperate, with more than 11,000 North African migrants arriving on Lampedusa over the past 10 days. Hundreds of police have been deployed to the island to help manage that influx. And we're now crossing live to Lampedusa to join our home and security editor, Mark White. So, Mark, um, dramatic scenes last week of thousands and thousands of North Africans piling ashore. What's the latest on Lampedusa? Well, this was the epicentre of those dramatic scenes. The Red Cross camp just on the outskirts of the main town in Lampedusa. I'm just going to step to the side uh, just to give you a shot. So these are the uh, front gates into the camp itself. We're not allowed inside. A lot of activity here, although things 
much, much calmer than they were just four or five days ago when they were dealing with thousands of people inside a camp that is only uh, purpose-built for 400 migrants. And we had scenes of the migrants in here actually scaling the perimeter fence because effectively they were inside uh, in very hot conditions, uh, quite cramped, so they wanted out and then we had them uh, wandering about into the main town itself and some clashes with the, the local police. As I say, a lot calmer than that uh, now, and that's thanks mainly to what they call the Mistral winds, which have been blowing for the last couple of days in the Mediterranean around this island. It's made the journey almost impassable, really, for these small boats, and has really cut the numbers crossing down very significantly. However, the authorities know that as soon as those winds die down, just as we see in the English Channel on the calm days, then the boats will return. And that's why we still have a very significant presence here of members of the Red Cross. We've got members of the Italian police force who've come from all over Italy. We were filming, actually, last night at the airport when we arrived uh, dozens of... Italian police officers who arrived at the airport uh, to help supplement and reinforce the officers that are here because they know that it will be very challenging for them in the days ahead, especially if they get another surge like we had about five or six days ago. Uh, there's other pictures that we'd like to show you that we filmed late last night. We're not normally allowed into this area of the harbour, of the port area uh, in Lampedusa, uh, but we got into an area um, where the boats are being stored, these empty migrant boats, dozens of boats, uh, some of them very dilapidated and certainly not in the slightest bit seaworthy. Uh, we could see... Uh, the rubber inner tubes that were being used as makeshift life jackets, clearly not at all suitable uh, for any kind of trouble that these migrants might have got into. Uh, and on the boats uh, themselves, uh, we could see uh, the numbers painted on. They do the same thing, Border Force, with the small boats that come across the English Channel. They paint the numbers on so they can keep a count of how many boats have crossed. And one of those boats had 975 slash 23 written on which effectively the 975th boat that had crossed in 2023 an indication of the massive numbers that we're talking about it does uh, just in Lampedusa itself really uh, dwarf the situation in the English Channel and it's not just Lampedusa. Um, it is, of course, other Italian islands. It is Greek islands and Spanish islands. All across the European Union's southern borders, you will get migrant crossings from North Africa to try to get into the European Union. And what we then find, because history has shown us that so, is that many of those who cross the southern border want to get up to the more prosperous countries in northern Europe. Europe, and many will go to the northwest beaches of France with a view to getting over uh, to the UK. Um, also, uh, in terms of the, the crisis here, though, clearly it's impacted this island of just 6,000 people. We spoke to uh, a couple of uh, local Italians who were visiting the island and, you know, they were very concerned at the situation. No, it doesn't change the uh, feel uh, feeling of the island, but uh, I see most uh, military presence of, in, uh, in the island. Concerned about the future, uh, about how it could be, but also a, a bit hopeful. But it, it can improve, the situation definitely can improve. Well, with no end in sight to this migrant crisis, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is now in the United States giving a keynote speech tomorrow in Washington where she will call on Western governments to come together to redraft uh, the Refugee Convention, uh, to have a united front in trying to tackle what is a very significant and growing threat.
OK, Mark Wyatt, live from Lampedusa. Thank you for that update. We will, of course, be coming back to you throughout the live desk through the rest of the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the Italian political commentator Paola Diana joins us now. Very good to see you this afternoon, Paola. I mean, how is this going down with the Italian people? The island of Lampedusa is tiny, just 20 kilometres squared. We're talking about 11,000 migrants crossing over in just 10 days. How is this being received by the people of Italy and by the media there? Well, the people of Italy, uh, they are shocked and they consider it an invasion. Let, let's talk it with the right uh, name. Uh, and it's not sustainable. We can't think that Italy can sustain these numbers of illegal migrants coming from Africa. And we have to remember people who think that uh, we should, that these are not engineers or very high skilled people like they were coming from Syria at the time. Uh, unfortunately, they're very poor people and they need everything. And Italy cannot sustain these numbers. And we know that France uh, is speaking in a very good way, saying that they have to help uh, uh, Italy and uh, the same the other countries. But at this moment in Ventimiglia, that is at the border with Italy, France has soldiers. They're blocking illegal migrants. And uh, Macron said after the Pope told uh, that France should do their their beat as well. Macron replied saying that France cannot um, uh, cannot have uh, all the cannot help with the misery of this world, and that's an interesting uh, attitude. Uh, it's not uh, in solidarity with Italy or with the European uh, concepts at all. So I think there is something more uh, urgent to do, and they should definitely change the whole refugee uh, legislation because that uh, is not sustainable. Words right out of my mouth. Um, the European Union is meant to be a collaborative project, and yet time and time again we see uh, when there's a migration crisis in one country, um, the borders are closed on the next country along. Macron um, saying he, he's not in any mood to help Italy. We've seen from Poland putting up borders, uh, barbed wire across their borders. How does this make the Italian public feel about the European Union? I mean, they're not sending out much help, are they? Absolutely, but the Italians now, they're moving uh, to the right. Uh, we know that uh, the centre-right coalition now reached 41%. That is a huge number, and I'm sure it will reach even farther if this uh, crisis won't be sorted. We need to block the... Uh, the, the starting point. We need to make agreements uh, with the uh, uh, African countries. Uh, Europe has to change completely the view on refugees because it's a very naive legislation. Uh, it's like they, we, we should help, uh, as Macron said, all the misery of this world, but it's not, uh, it's not factual. In reality, it's impossible. So we should be more pragmatic and definitely help people not to risk their life crossing the border. They should stay in uh, in Tunisia and Libya, that are the countries where they uh, come the most. Paolo, we haven't got long with you, but I did want to ask you about the similarities in the rhetoric between the Italian Prime Minister and our Prime Minister here, Rishi Sunak. I mean, Rishi Sunak, one of his five key pledges is to stop the boats. Giorgia Maloney, the Italian Prime Minister, she promised exactly the same thing, didn't she? And just speaking to the press yesterday, she said she hoped she could have done better on controlling immigration. She, she's failed on that promise, hasn't she? Unfortunately, so far, uh, we can say that she failed, but not because of her will, because of the international law on international uh, seas. So we have to change the law, particularly in this case for Italy, the European law, that uh, doesn't let Italy use the, uh, the Navy to stop the boats. At the moment, uh, it's an emergency, so they should definitely think about uh, changing the legislation because the one that we have right now, it's not a good one for this type of emergency mm -hmm. and definitely not for the future. OK, Paolo, Diana, really good to see you this afternoon. Thank you very much. She's an Italian political commentator. Do you agree? Do let us know. GBviews at gbnews.com. <laughs> Yeah, it seems European nations are just joined in their hopelessness of stopping this issue. Anyway, let's move on now. It's time to go through all the latest sports news with legendary Aidan McGee. Let's start with the rugger. And it's got to be said, some fantastic results for the home nations. 
Without doubt, I can't remember a World Cup, Martin, when the home nations have been so strong. It's almost as if we're seeing a power shift from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere. Wales rattling in 40 points mm. against Australia. I mean, you saw, you saw Eddie Jones's face afterwards. I mean, he was absolutely shell-shocked. And it's the Australian public. I think there's some collateral damage there as well with the fact that he did so well with England getting into a World Cup final. I think that they hold him, they hold him kind of in lesser regard now because of his links to England, but they certainly hold him responsible for what's been going on. So great performance by, by Wales. England, a bit of a read-through, 12 changes, still managed to rattle in 71 points against the hapless uh, Chile. With more teams in the tournament, you do see a little bit of a dilution of the quality, and that was, was an example of that. And, of course, it was a stellar match where the elite teams went up against each other. Ireland, number one in the world, against number two in the world, South Africa. 13-8 was the score. I don't think it's the last time we'll see those two meet in this competition. I think they're stronger than France at the moment, especially if France are going to be without Antoine Dupont, who has a, a cheekbone injury. I think you could see them again in the final. They are certainly the best two teams in the world, as things stand. And I think, again, Mystic McGee said you, see, you, you saw that as a kind of playthrough of a potential final. And you said the winner of this could win the whole thing. Ireland. They look fantastic. They do, they do. Listen, Mr. Mr. the rules of Mr McGee are that when you make a prediction, it does have to come to pass. Uh, so <laughs> so we've still got, we're still still relative, relatively early in the tournament, but I'll tell you what, Ireland, Ireland look irrepressible at the moment. But so does South Africa, mm. and it's making for a brilliant tournament. And it's got to be said, I know we shouldn't delight in the misery of the Australians, but please indulge me. Um, the Australian press are really scratching their head about the absolutely miserable performance of their team. It, it seems like the entire game has fallen apart down under. Yeah, I don't think there is a, even a, is a, a vague mathematical uh, permutation that could see them get through. But, I mean, they lost to Fiji uh, last week. Terrible performance uh, in, in that game. And they just don't seem to have anything about them. I don't, as I say, I don't remember an Australian side... Uh, as weak as this. I mean, the Southern Hemisphere threat certainly coming from South Africa and from New Zealand now. But Eddie Jones, you just wonder how long he's got. Mm. So, come on, Mystic McGee. Um, who's going to win the thing? Uh, I'm going to stick my neck out and go for Ireland. Yeah. I'm going to go for Ireland. Yeah, I do have an Irish passport, so I've got, I've got some skin in the race. And so, as far as England's hopes, I mean, been pretty dismal so far, apart from the 71, but they expected to hammer yeah. Chile. But it's been mostly kicking. I mean, can yeah, they it, it has. Snip? Well, you know, listen, I mean, England won the World Cup in, 20, in 2003 as a kicking uh, side. They were very adept at that and they played to their strengths with Johnny Wilkinson, etc. However, they may need more than that this time. But I have to say, you know what? If I was, even if, if I was Ireland, South Africa, New Zealand, France, I'm not sure I want to face England in a knockout stage just because they are a country with reputation, with pedigree. And if they keep going through these tournaments, they keep rattling in points, even yeah. allowing for the fact they've made changes. Don't forget, they won the first game against Argentina early with 14 men. So okay. there's momentum building there. And who knows, when they get into the, in the knockouts, anything can happen. OK, yeah. Aidan, we have to leave it there, because, Ellie, I think we have some breaking news. Yeah, we do. Thanks, Aidan. We have some breaking news in the last few minutes. Enough firearms officers mm. have returned to armed duties for the Metropolitan Police to be able to meet its counter-terrorism responsibilities without military help. And we'll be back outside Scotland Yard with Theo Chikombra to talk about that after this short break. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. It's a bright Monday for many of us. Still some showers around, especially in the north and the west. And it will be windy in the far north, but not as windy as it's expected to be midweek. We've got low pressure to the northwest of the UK. We've got a cold front crossing the country. That's led to fresher but brighter conditions up and down the land. And um, sunshine, actually plenty of sunshine for the east and the south of England. Eastern Scotland seeing some decent sunny spells. But there will be shower clouds elsewhere. One or two showers for Wales and northwest England. But the bulk of the showers affecting western Scotland and Northern Ireland. A brisk wind for many, especially towards the northwest, and feeling on the cool side in the northwest, but still some warmth in the sunshine towards the southeast, 23 Celsius, the afternoon high. Heading into the evening then, and actually many of the showers will disappear. Winds fall light across central and eastern parts with a few mist patches forming by dawn. But at this stage, we've got thickening clouds towards the west, a freshening breeze once again. And it's a relatively mild night in urban areas, but in some rural spots, temperatures dipping into the single figures. A bright start then for many, but from the word go, we've got showers pushing into the central and eastern parts of England. And then this more persistent band of rain moving through Northern Ireland first thing into Scotland, Northern England. Showery stuff coming into Wales and the southwest. And all of it turns to showers by the end of the afternoon. Highs of 23 Celsius.
The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes, and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio, and online, Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m., only on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 2pm and you're on the live desk here on GB News with me, 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 Martin and Ellie Costello. Coming up this Monday lunchtime. Some breaking news in the last few minutes. Enough firearms officers have returned to armed duties for the Metropolitan Police to be able to meet its counter-terrorism responsibilities without military help. We'll have the latest from Scotland Yard. And more than 11,000 migrants have arrived in Lampedusa from North Africa in the past 10 days. Our Home Affairs and Security Editor Mark White is on the island. And I'm on the Italian island of Lampedusa, where more than 11,000 migrants have crossed in just over a week. Many of those will end up in northwestern France, aiming to cross to the United Kingdom. And Rishi Sunak refuses to confirm whether HS2 will continue past Birmingham, with former Chancellor George Osborne saying the move would be an act of huge economic self-harm. We'll have the latest reaction from Westminster.
Plus, we'll have more on that hugely successful weekend of rugby for the home nations in the World Cup. First, here's your headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Very good afternoon, Jim. It's a minute past two. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. Well, as you've just been hearing, the Met Police says enough firearms officers have returned to armed duties so they can meet its counter-terrorism responsibilities without military help. A significant number of counter-terrorism counter firearm officers had stepped back from duties after a colleague was charged with murder over the shooting of Chris Caba in South London last year. The army had been put on standby in the event of a terror alert, but Scotland Yards confirmed it now has sufficient personnel. Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth says people need confidence in the police. It's vital that they, that they have support, but there are also safeguards in place. Now, there's been a, a review announced by the Home Secretary. We don't know the details of that review yet. There's also that live uh, prosecution, that court case. So I want, to, I want, as a politician, to be careful about how I comment on these matters, as you would, as you would appreciate. But we obviously need to make sure we have uh, procedures in place which commands the confidence of both the police officers and the communities they serve. The Mayor of Greater Manchester says the North shouldn't have to pay for the government's mismanagement of HS2. Rishi Sunak is refusing to guarantee the Manchester leg will be completed, with a decision expected to be announced before the Tory party conference in the city next week. Andy Burnham says curtailing the project represents the opposite of levelling up, but the Prime Minister insists he is committed to the long-term Tory pledge. This kind of speculation that people are you know, making is not right. I mean, we've got spades in the ground, we're getting on and delivering, but across the north, what we're also doing is connecting up all the towns and cities of, uh, in the north, east to west. That's a really important part of how we will create jobs, drive growth across the region, all part of our plans to level up. Free ports are another good example of that, whether that's in Teesside or elsewhere, attracting new investment, new businesses coming in, all good examples of the government levelling up. The Home Secretary will call for unity amongst Western leaders to combat the global migration crisis. Suella Braverman will tell an audience in Washington that other countries uh, can learn from the UK's innovative attempts to tackle illegal migrants. She is questioning whether conventions and legal frameworks designed more than 50 years ago are fit for purpose. She's also calling for a shake-up of the international rules. Serial killer Lucy Letby is facing a retrial on the attempted murder of a girl known only as Child K. The former nurse was jailed for life for murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at a hospital in Chester between 2015 and 16. Uh, jurors were unable to reach a verdict on six further counts of attempted murder. A provisional date has been set for June next year. One million NHS appointments have been cancelled since December because of strikes in England. Last week's industrial action by junior doctors and consultants mean the country will reach that milestone in figures set to be announced later. Another double strike is scheduled for next week. The organisation's deputy chief executive, Saffron Cordery, has labelled it damaging and demoralising. Meanwhile, almost 400,000 patients in England waited 24 hours or more in A&E last year. The Royal College of Med Emergency Medicine is calling the situation a matter of national shame. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting says 24 hours in A&E is no longer just a documentary. But the Department of Health and Social Care claims improvements are being made through the NHS recovery plan. Experts are warning the government will not meet its manifesto pledge to end homelessness by next year. The Curse Lake Commission says there are chronic and unresolved issues in the housing system with a crisis pushing more people onto the streets. The number of people sleeping rough last autumn was 25% higher than the same time three years ago. The government says it's spending £2 billion to end rough sleeping for good. And a space capsule carrying soil from the surface of an asteroid has been recovered by NASA. The sample was collected by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft before making the 1.2 billion mile journey uh, back to Earth. It was parachuted through the atmosphere and landed in the Utah desert yesterday. Now, scientists hope it will shed light on the formation of the solar system and the origin of life on Earth. The sample is some four and a half billion years old. This is GB News on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker.
Just say, play GB News. That's it. Now it's back to Martin and Ellie. Thanks, Aaron. So to that breaking news story, as we just heard, the Met Police has just announced that enough counter-terrorism firearms officers have returned to armed duties to be able to meet its responsibilities without military help. Yes, we've had a statement from the Metropolitan Police in the last 15 minutes or so that says that as of lunchtime on Monday, the number of officers who'd returned to armed duties was sufficient for us to no longer require external assistance to meet our counter-terrorism responsibilities. They say they're grateful to the Ministry of Defence Defense and the armed forces personnel involved for all of their support. They say that a limited number of armed forces from other UK police forces will continue to support the non-counterterrorism armed policing, but they do say they do still call for support, which will be under review. So that statement from the Metropolitan Police in the last 15 minutes or so. Yeah, and of course, this follows the CPS last week charging a Met's firearms officer with murder over the shooting of an unarmed black man, Chris Cabber, in South London. Well, let's cross now to GB News' national reporter, Theo Chicomba, at Scotland Yard. Theo, a significant update. Um, so, for now, um, no armed forces services required, but a key detail, it seems that other forces across the UK may be helping the Met out. Yes, well, it's been fast moving throughout the day. Of course, we heard the Home Secretary launching at that review into firearms policing. And of course, we've heard from the Prime Minister and the opposition as well throughout today. But of course, that latest line from the Metropolitan Police saying they do have enough now, enough officers have returned to armed duties for the Metropolitan Police uh, to be able to meet its counter-terrorism responsibility without military help, the force has said. Now, of course, we were asking that question, are they going to have sufficient numbers in the next coming days? Of course, when you do hear that a large number of them have taken time uh, to consider their position following their colleague who was charged with murder last week following that fatal shooting of Chris Cabba in September last year. There were some concerns we'd heard from officers saying they are finding it difficult with this process. What does this mean uh, for them and their families? Now, of course, in response to that review uh, to what the Home Secretary has said, this is what the Housing Minister had to say earlier today. Very important um, that we support our extremely brave firearms officers. They have to make split-second decisions to keep the public safe, and, and they have our full support in doing that. I think it's really important that your listeners know that that cooperation with the soldiers, with the Military of Defence, is very standard for the government. It's something that I've been involved with previously as a minister in different departments. And, of course, those are professionals. They will work with the Met Police. Um, the soldiers will be working to keep the public safe. They won't have powers of arrest, uh, but ultimately these are operational matters for the police, for the Met Police Commissioner, uh, and keeping the public safe in whatever eventuality will be their first priority. Well, the Home Secretary had said that she'd issued a message of support to the Metropolitan Police officers, some of those who had concerns about potentially ending up in the dock. And we also heard from the Met's Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, who's welcomed at the Home Office review. And in an open letter, he said it was right that the force uh, was held to the high standards, but the current system was undermining his officers and suggested they needed more legal protections. But, of course, with this new line that we've heard from the Metropolitan Police that they have enough today, will this be the same uh, going forward for the rest of this week? And, of course, uh, when others are potentially meant to return, what are the attitudes around the safety and how are people feeling in the capital? Yeah, questions remain, Theo Chikomba. As you say, a fast-moving story, and you've been across it for us all morning and this afternoon as well. So thank you very much for being there for us at New Scotland Yard. Well, join us now to discuss more. This is former head of counter as a major general chip chapman my favorite terror man hello chip welcome to the show a significant development chip um, that for now soldiers have been stood down and it appears that that um, armed response officers from other forces have been drafted in to help the met yeah the first thing to say is that there's 43 other home department police forces so under mutual aid you can always request from another force that sort of armed firearms capability from other forces. That should be the first 
point core. The second one is that there's always authority available to a requesting department if it needs it. We saw that with the Department of Health, for example, on COVID. And if it wants to request, it goes to the MOD and the MOD will resource that the way it needs to. We're saying that there is actually a, a standing operation Op tempora, which uh, it kicks in with up to 3,800 people giving support to counterterrorism and police. If the threat level goes up to critical, the threat level at the moment is substantial. And that occurred twice in 2017 after the Manchester attack and the Parsons Green attack. Mm. How do you think this went down in the Metropolitan Police when these armed police officers started to hand back their weapons? I mean, we, we saw in the papers yesterday uh, some of the numbers that were being talked about. Uh, more than 100 officers, uh, what some sources are saying, had turned in their permits. Uh, other papers suggesting more than 300 had done so. I mean, you can see why the Met had to scramble, really, to react to this quickly, to call on other forces to support those in London and to rearm the Met. Well, of course, um, anyone who's an armed firearms officer has responsibility and authority. And to exercise that authority, you have to do it in a very careful way. And 100 people withdrew that authority. Actually, overall in the country, there's something like 6,129, uh, 192, sorry, armed officers. So withdrawing of 100 would mean you could pull in 100 from the other Home Department police forces. The second thing is whether it was a sort of minor tactic to try and put pressure to say that this is wrong for the case of what happened to the uh, mm. police officer. Of course, due process of law needs to take place for mm. that. We might not like it, but that's the way that the, the process works. And Chip, how, how right do you think we've got this balance? Clearly, um, firearms officers feeling abandoned by their leadership um, on this specific case. And we've seen historically, of course, with prosecutions against former servicemen in the, the arenas of Northern Ireland and if Afghanistan. Do you think sometimes the, the rank and file police officer, the rank and file servicemen, sometimes feel their leadership aren't really in their corner? Well, I think there's, there's two aspects to that. The first one is you can never take a bullet back and the, um, it's the critical moment if there's something that happens. Now, actually, I would suggest that in the last five or six years when we've had a fair few terrorist attacks that uh, the number of times that police have opened fire in major, police, uh, major terrorist incidents, and we're talking about Westminster attack in March 17, the London Bridge Borough Market attack in June 17, the Fishmongers attack in November 19, and the February 20 Streatham attack, all those occasions when the police opened fire, a verdict of lawfully killed was out there. So it's, it's not quite true that that is the case. If the threat is there, and that is the key variable, if the threat is there from either a terrorist or a significantly armed criminal, then you can lawfully open fire. Um, and most of the time you'll be supported. Now, the process, of course, is that if you do open fire and the discharging of weapons is not that common. So in the two years, both to March 20 to 21 and March 21 to 22, there were only four occasions that the police opened fire in those years. So it is still quite rare uh, to open fire. But the process is you discharge your weapon, you're going to be suspended. But then the Independent Office for Police Conduct kicks in. And of course, the CPS will only charge some, someone if it meets both the public interest test and the evidential test. And the evidential test is not the same as the test which would be in court. It isn't an emotional test, it's a test of evidence. Mm. Very interested then to get your thoughts on the comments of Sir Mark Rowley, who has welcomed a Home Office review into armed policing. And in that open letter to Suella Bradman, the Home Secretary, he said it was right that his force was held to the highest standards, but the current system was undermining his officers and suggested they needed more legal protections. What do you make of, of those comments? Do you think that armed police officers do need more legal protections? Well, it's, it's a curious one. The first thing is that the, um, the emotional and psychi uh, psycho psycho psychiatric pressure on officers is significant when they are suspended. So a lot of the IOPC uh, investigations can take a number of years. So justice delayed, justice denied is the first point. So in process terms, it would be great if they could um, speed that up. Now, I'm not really quite sure what we're going to get to apart from that, because we're not going to change the law. The law is the law. 
That is, you act within the law. If you break the law, we can't allow police officers or soldiers to be involved in uh, arbitrary extrajudicial murder. So it is a, a difficult uh, judgment. But the two key things when you are trained as a firearms officer and do judgmental training is um, what would you do now and is it legal to fire? And that's going to be uppermost in your mind. Uh, now, in the case that we are talking about here, of course, we think at that the moment that the protagonist on the other side was unarmed. That doesn't really justify you opening fire with lethal force. And Chip, um, in general terms, when there is a terrorist incident, um, you mentioned a list of them there, how on standby are the armed forces ordinarily or are the firearms officers within the Metropolitan Police or other forces, are they sufficiently capable of handling this without military invention? Well, most of the time they are. So, for example, if you look again at the statistics in the year to March 22, there were 18,259 um, firearms operations, of which 16,800 used arms from armed response vehicles. So that was all taken care of within the police. Now, special forces would be used in uh, three occasions, really. The first one is for maritime counterterrorism. We saw that in October 20, with a ship which was had a load of stowaways who uh, took care of it. The second one would be if we had a sort of Mumbai 2011 attack, either an, a marauding attack linked with a sea, season hold attack, something beyond the collective capability of the police when um, the special air service would come in. And the third one, which has been used before on the GB mainland, is the use of the um, Special Reconnaissance Regiment to do surveillance of targets. Uh, and that was essentially one of the things, I think, which could have happened here, because if you had surveillance teams who were armed who couldn't follow people, then um, the Special Reconnaissance Regiment might have had to come in and do that. That's essentially what the police did, for example, in following the Streatham attacker in 2020, and he was then he was someone who was just released from prison, bought some knives, was going on a rampage, and was shot dead by those surveillance officers who were tailing him. Okay. Major General Chip Chapman, really good to have your analysis on the programme this afternoon. Thank you very much. He's the former head of counterterrorism. Just reacting to that news that enough firearms officers have returned uh, to armed duties for the Metropolitan Police to be able to meet its counterterrorism responsibilities without any military help. They are being helped, aren't they, from the forces across the country. Uh, but that does mean that there are now enough firearms officers in place to meet its counterterrorism responsibilities. Yeah, good stuff. OK, after the break, Europe's migrant crisis. We are live in Lampedusa off Italy, where over 10,000 migrants have landed in the past week alone. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there. Today's showers will ease during the rest of the day. Clear spells expected overnight, but it will stay breezy. However, not as windy as we're expecting things to turn during the middle of the week. This area of low pressure doesn't look like much over the next day or so. Storm Agnes, but it soon deepens as it approaches the UK and a swathe of very strong winds, gales widely, are expected around the middle of the week. Before that, Monday night, clear spells for most of us. Still rather breezy in the west and the northwest, but most places dry through the hours of darkness. The cloud thickening in the south and the west by the end of the night. Temperatures generally not far from average for the time of year. We're looking at the uh, low double figures generally. But we start off Tuesday with some showers getting going from the word go into the south and then the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast. They do clear through the morning. A rumble of thunder is possible as the showers turn livelier in places. A spell of persistent rain moves through Northern Ireland during the morning into Western Scotland, clearing to showers later. And for many, there will be some sunny spells by the afternoon in between the showers. But it's a blustery afternoon, making it feel on the cool side. Still quite warm in the southeast, nevertheless. That's all out of the way by the start of Wednesday. Actually, Wednesday starts off fine for most of us. Plenty of early sunshine, light winds during the morning. But Storm Agnes brings a swathe of very wet weather and very strong winds in during the afternoon and early evening could cause disruption in the West. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News.
What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. You're watching The Live Desk with myself and Martin Daubney. We do love to hear from you throughout the programmes. Do keep your views coming in. GBviews at gbnews.com. We'll share some with you after the next news bulletin. Now, now, the Home Secretary, Swella Bravman, is set to call on Western leaders to collaborate to tackle the global migrant crisis. Yeah, it comes as the situation in Europe becomes increasingly desperate, with more than 11,000 North African immigrants arriving on Lampedusa over this past 10 days alone. Well, hundreds of police have been deployed to the island to help to manage the influx. Let's cross now live to Lampedusa and join our Home and Security Editor, Mark White. Mark, what's the latest? Uh, we spoke to Paola Diana earlier on about the reaction in Italy, and she was telling us that the Italians are horrified by what she is calling an invasion. Yeah, there's no doubt they are. This is a very serious situation they're facing on multiple fronts. Uh, we're at the epicentre of where uh, thousands of migrants came uh, to the Red Cross camp here on the outskirts of uh, the main town in Lampedusa. I'm just going to pop out of the way because we can show you actually, uh, as we zoom in on this shot, uh, some of the migrants who are still here in this camp up there just uh, sitting by 
these tables just uh, passing the day, I guess. Um, but it was a far different scene to this uh, less than a week ago when at its height, uh, remember, 11,000 came uh, in the space of a week, uh, but at, at its height here, there was 7,000 uh, migrants who were in this particular camp here. And that put a very significant strain on the camp and on the Red Cross members of staff and volunteers who were here trying to do their best to help uh, those migrants, but they were all crammed in here in very hot conditions. Uh, there was trouble. Uh, quite a number of the people that were in here scaled the perimeter fence, got into the main town in Lampedusa itself. There were clashes with the Italian police as the police tried to push them back into the camp. So those scenes the authorities here are desperate to prevent a repetition of. However, there is some real concern that as the weather improves later this week, we will see a surge in boats crossing again. What we saw um, up until the weekend were significant numbers arriving. However, we've had fairly windy conditions out in the Mediterranean, which has slowed down the arrival rate very significantly. So we've got very few boats now coming across. But once those winds die down, and we're told Wednesday is when conditions are about to improve again, then there will be a lot more boats coming across. And that's why police reinforcements have come in to Lampedusa. As we arrived at the main airport last night, we saw um, Italian police officers arriving. They've been coming from all over. We've been speaking to some of them just now uh, from different areas, from Sicily, um, from Palermo, uh, from Milan, uh, all over, just coming to supplement the local officers here who would given it's only a, an island population of uh, 6,000, only be a dozen or so that would uh, really be policing this island. But given the exceptional circumstances, that's why uh, we've had so many officers uh, come here. Uh, we also were able, in the early hours of this morning, to get down to the port and an area of the port that you're normally restricted from going anywhere near during the day. But that enabled us to see some of the many migrant boats and they come in all shapes and sizes from these uh, inflatable boats that you're used to seeing coming across the English Channel uh, to what look like small fishing boats uh, that have come across as well uh, and all manner of other types of boats in between. What they all have in common is they were all rickety as as hell and not at all seaworthy. Um, there was uh, inner tubes, these tire inner tubes inside many of the boats and that's what the African migrants were using as makeshift life jackets which would not really have done anything for them uh, if that boat had sank in the middle of the Mediterranean like so many have. It is coming up to the 10 year anniversary of a very significant tragedy here in Lampedusa where more than 300 African migrants drowned when their boat got into difficulties. But the lessons have not been learned. There have been multiple tragedies on a very regular basis out there in the Mediterranean since. And the authorities will be all too aware that they do not want to repeat those kind of tragedies, Mark. I mean, you're just in front of that camp in Lampedusa for us now. Can you tell us what kind of people are making these journeys? Is it men? Is it women and children? Uh, yeah, just speaking actually um, a short time ago to one of the Red Cross staff here who tells us that uh, those crossing are mostly from sub-Saharan Africa, um, that they are 76% male um, and 10% uh, female, uh, and then the rest, 14%, is that, uh, who are minors. 
So the vast majority, as we see, of course, uh, with those crossing the English Channel are young men uh, who are crossing. Uh, and if they're anything like those who I've spoken to many times around Dunkirk and around Calais, uh, then many of them uh, are really after a better life. That's not to say that they're not leaving behind wretched circumstances and, you know, very scant opportunity to better themselves. Uh, but that puts you in the class, of course, of an economic migrant. However, if you listen to uh, the charities, the NGOs, they will tell you that everyone that's coming across, of course, are refugees fleeing for their lives. And uh, as I say, for many years of covering this story, that's just not what I've found. And the people I've spoken to that deal with these people on a regular basis say that that's not what they've found either. And Mark, I'm um, also speaking to Paola Diana now about the political implications. France's interior minister coming out and saying they will not take any of the migrants from Lampedusa. So once again, Mark, it asks the question, when these humanitarian crises strike European member states, rather than acting as a cohesive unit, they seem to put up the drawbridge. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm just going to pop out the way to... Let you see one of the um, Italian Red Cross vehicles just arriving at the main gate here and uh, which will be going in very shortly. A lot of these Red Cross resources now coming uh, here to Lampedusa ready for what they believe will be a very significant surge in migrant crossings again once the weather improves. But you're right to talk about the situation within the European Union. There is, uh, not to put uh, uh, too fine a point on it, in fighting between many of these European countries, with France and Germany refusing to take Italian migrants from the likes of Lampedusa, accusing the Italians of not doing enough to take their fair share of European Union uh, migrants. So it's all a bit of a mess, uh, but it is a crisis that's not just affecting Italy, it's affecting Greece and Spain also on the southern borders, and it's also affecting those Eastern European countries with the routes that are coming in through the Western Balkans. OK, Mark White, live from Lampedusa, thank you for that update. And just to put some, some context on the numbers here, 130,000 migrants have arrived in the past year to Italy. We've had 108,000 in the UK since we started recording in 2018. A huge amount of illegal immigrants arriving in Italy via small boats. Yeah, well, as Mark says, this is a European-wide issue and a number of those migrants that we're seeing on Lampedusa right now will make their way through Europe. Uh, some will end up in the northwest of France where they will try to cross into Britain and that's where it becomes about us, doesn't it? And we're going to be seeing a special report from Portland where the community remains divided over the Bibby Stockholm barge. But first, let's get a news bulletin with Aaron Armstrong. Very good afternoon to you. It is 2.33. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Let's start with some breaking news. In the last few minutes, a motorbike rider died in a collision in central London while being followed by police. And the motorcycle collided with a taxi early this morning after travelling through a red light and failing to stop for officers. A passenger who sustained non-life-threatening injuries was arrested after being found with a machete. And the Met has launched an inquiry alongside an independent investigation. Uh, meanwhile, the army have been stood down after the Met Police confirmed it now has sufficient numbers of counter-terrorism officers to deal with an incident. A significant number of armed police had stepped back from duties after a colleague was charged with murder over the shooting of Chris Caba in South London last year. But Scotland Yard says it can now meet its counter-terrorism responsibilities without military help. Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham has warned that curtailing the HS2 project risks creating a north-south chasm. The government claims the decision hasn't been taken. Despite mounting speculation, the Birmingham to Manchester leg is to be scrapped amid spiralling costs. The Prime Minister has refused to guarantee the completion of the project, but insists he is committed to levelling up. Serial killer Lucy Letby is facing a retrial on the attempted murder of a girl known only as Child K. The former nurse was jailed for life for murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at a hospital in Chester between 2015 and 2016. 
Jurors were unable to reach a verdict on six further counts of attempted murder. A provisional date has been set for June next year. And NHS strikes are thought to have led to the cancellation of more than a million appointments since December. Figures due to be released later are expected to confirm the milestone in the wake of last week's double strike by junior doctors and consultants. That's it from me for the moment. You can get more on all of our stories on our website, gbnews.com. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of gb news is and that's the most fundamentally important thing gb news provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard we don't hold back we're free to say what we really think just because some people who live in a tiny little westminster bubble think that their particular story is important that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 2.39 and let's have a look at some of your views, shall we? And don't forget, you can always email us anytime, gbviews at gbnews.com. It's the highlight of the show hearing from you and your thoughts on all of the stories that we're covering. So thank you so much for keeping us company. Well, James has been in touch this afternoon. He says 11,000 people in just 10 days, of course, talking about the island of Lampedusa off Italy. He says, why do governments around the world not consider helping countries in North Africa and the Middle East? to ensure that Europe isn't constantly seeing such a huge influx on people onto the continent. And Ellie, I've said it before and I'll say it again, if only you have people like you 
Running the country, we might have a chance. Brian says this, I find it hilarious that our government thinks we have any authority at all when it comes to stopping illegal migration. We're the laughing stock of Europe. As always, from Sunak, big talk and little action. But so interesting, isn't it, to see the, the parallels, really, mm. in, in rhetoric in Italy and here. It's the same. It's exactly yeah. the same, literally the same sentence. Yeah. I will stop the boats. That's exactly what the Italian Prime Minister has said. It's exactly what Rishi Sunak has said in one of his... Five pledges. But the numbers are just eye-watering in Italy. As I said, 130,000 illegals in the past year alone. We've had 108,000 since records began in 2018. It's a massive, massive issue for that coast. Yeah, it is. And we've also been reacting to the news that enough firearms officers have returned to armed duties for the Metropolitan Police to be able to meet its counter-terrorism responsibilities without the need for military help. Sue's been responding to this. She says, I have complete sympathy for the firearms officers who put down their guns over the past few days. Why should they fear spending their lives in prison for simply doing their job? Solidarity with those brave men who put their lives on the line and it's for the rest of us. It has to be said, Ellie, that we've had a load of responses and almost universally they've been supporting the boys and girls in blue. Mm. Colin says this, what a colossal and embarrassing waste of money HS2 is. Isn't it hilarious how billions of pounds can be found when it suits the government really makes me sick. Well, do keep those views coming in on any of the stories that we've been talking about today, and there have been many of them. Yes. I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say about HS2, especially if you live in the northwest of the country. So do let us know what you make of that. GBviews at gbnews.com. OK, on to our next story now. Lucy Letby will face a retrial on an outstanding allegation that she attempted to murder a baby girl. Yes, the former nurse was sentenced to a whole life order for killing seven babies and the attempted murder of six others. But the jury was unable to reach verdicts on six further counts relating to five children. Well, our North West of England reporter Sophie Reaper is outside Manchester Crown Court. Sophie, what's the latest? Well, we heard this morning from Nick Johnson KC, who's been the lead prosecutor on this trial since it began all the way uh, back in October of last year. He told the court here at Manchester this morning that the prosecution would be seeking a retrial, but as it stands only on count 14 on the indictment, which, as you say, relates to the attempted murder of child K. As for those other five hung counts relating to child H, J, N and Q, as it stands, Nick Johnson said, the Crown is not currently seeking a retrial on those particular counts. Now, Justice Goss, who's been the judge presiding over this case, he said that he would estimate that that retrial uh, relating to count 14 would take around two to three weeks. But he did also say that the next available date for that retrial wouldn't be until at least June 10th of next year. So that was put in the diary, but of course it is still quite a way away, so that very well could change. Uh, as for Lucy Letby herself, of course, we do know that she and her legal team have uh, lodged an application to make that appeal, a very complex process which is now only just getting underway. We also know, of course, very controversially, she didn't appear for her sentencing uh, last month here at Manchester Crown Court, but she did appear here at Manchester Crown Court today to hear about this potential retrial. She appeared uh, via a video link from HMP New Hall. Uh, she seemed fairly indifferent to the proceedings. She didn't really seem to have much of a reaction. She only spoke twice, first to confirm her name and second to confirm uh, to the court that she could see and hear everything clearly. But that was it. We heard Heard no more from Lucy Letby. She remained silent uh, throughout the rest of the proceedings. And of course, uh, we now know uh, that that retrial will take place next year, but she had no reaction to that either. Sophie Reaper, you've been there for us since day one. And uh, as you said a little bit earlier on, it does look as though this is set to continue, I'm afraid. Very, very good to see you this afternoon. And thank you for bringing us up to speed. Okay, on to our next story. The Bibby Stockholm is set to reopen to asylum seekers possibly as early as this week after receiving the all clear from Legionella bacteria. Yes, as our southwest of England reporter Jeff Moody explains, the community of Portland is tired, frustrated, and now turning on each other. 
another cruise ship docks in Portland, its passengers spilling out onto the streets to buy souvenirs. And this is what greets them when they arrive, a town that's on its feet and marching, a town that's divided, a town that's angry. Two rival protest groups, united in wanting the barge gone, divided in every other way possible. And they're turning on each other. Dr Susan Phoenix is from No to the Barge. People were there doing their best for their community, they thought, and suddenly they would get something really horrid written onto the Facebook account uh, that had no relation to anything or anybody. But of course, it's a good way of shutting down um, arguments. So, oh, you're a racist, oh, you're a Nazi, oh, you're this, that and the other. And people go, oh, oh, am I? And so they take a while to realise, no, they're not. So that local people are bullying each other. Uh, and they don't even realise they're doing it, you know, which is very sad. Alex Bailey headed up the No to the Barge campaign. He's taken a step back because he says the online abuse has become unbearable. Deeply upsetting. Um, it has affected me personally, emotionally. Um, to be called things that... Quite, quite frankly, it's, it's awful. Theresa Churchill fears for her community. The division is growing deeper by the week. Um, we're seeing different protesting groups coming into town, um, people being bussed in. Then they disappear, go home, away from Portland, um, and leave the community even deeper divided. And that division is playing out on social media. Cloning of people's Facebook accounts, uh, malicious emails and texts. I'm really, I want to say I'm shocked. And I don't think there's another word for it, Jeff. I am shocked because why are people behaving like this in a civilised society? We're not built for it. We're not built for the constant harassment, the constant attacks on social media. GB News has repeatedly asked the Stand Up to Racism campaign for comment. They have so far refused. Off camera, they tell me I'm giving voice to racists. I'm only presenting one side of the story. But they won't tell me their side. The divisions, the bitterness, have been festering here for months. And not a single migrant lives on the barge. The Bibby Stockholm, at the centre of so much fear and hate, remains empty. But that could change. Any day now. Jeff Moody, GB News. That's the latest from Jeff Moody in Portland. The Bibby Stockholm, the only boat the government has managed to stop. And just in terms of the numbers, we would need 48 Bibby Stockholms just to take those who arrived illegally this year alone. The Bibby Stockholm is a solution nobody wants in that community, quite clearly, Ellie. Well, let us know what you make of that story. GBviews at gbnews.com. Now, Rishi Sunak has refused to commit to the northern leg of the HS2, but says he is committed to levelling up. Yeah, the Prime Minister wouldn't guarantee the Birmingham to Manchester leg will be completed. He'll discuss its future with the Chancellor this week, with a decision expected before the Tory party conference in Manchester next week. Well, our political editor, Chris Hope, joins us now in the studio. Very good to see you, Chris see you. Hope. I mean, this is very, very awkward, isn't it? This all could be announced just as Tory party conference kicks off in Manchester. Yes, it's a de devil timing for the Prime Minister. The Tories, of course, go north to Manchester for this weekend's party conference, and to have this hanging over the whole conference will be a disaster for the PM and Number 10 and his advisers. They'll want to try and get some sort of solution. Um, I thought the in indicative from the, the lobby briefing, the, the briefing we go to as journalists of, of um, Number 10 th this morning, they talked there about they have rephased re re part of the project in the past because of affordability. And I reckon while well, they might try and do is just fudge it so that they can e they can push out these costs further down the track because this week is a very difficult week with levelling up in the news, mm. Manchester and everything else. But, but earlier, um, um, Mr United did speak to reporters about what his plans were for levelling up and particularly HS2. Let's have a uh, listen to what you had to say. 
This kind of speculation that people are you know, making is not right. I mean, we've got spades in the ground, we're getting on and delivering, but across the north, what we're also doing is connecting up all the towns and cities of, uh, in the north, east to west. That's a really important part of how we will create jobs, drive growth across the region, all part of our plans to level up. Free ports are another good example of that, whether that's in Teesside or elsewhere, attracting new investment, new businesses coming in, all good examples of the government levelling up. Well, Chris, um, Rishi there is keeping calm and carrying on, but um, his plans hit the buffers, so to speak, with Boris Johnson, who called this a mutilated version of HS2. Um, George Osborne has waded in, remember him, saying it's a gross <laughs> act of vandalism. David Cameron, Lord Heseltine, all having yeah. a pop. All how useful is that? How helpful is that just before conference? All three, all four, all part of yesteryear, aren't they, Martin? Mm. I mean, they're not really... They're not really they, they are not in, in the room with a, their pen on the chapbook looking at the... the the, the issues they got with the COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine and the, and the cost of living crisis and spiralling inflation, although it should be done down by, by this time next year. So, yeah, it's, it's not helpful to have noises off, particularly from, from uh, um, uh, yeah, former prime ministers and chancellors who, who, who maybe should know better. Chris, how is this going to go down with voters? I mean, we're talking mm. about a general election. It hasn't been announced yet, but it could be this time next year mm. or, or thereabouts, mm. especially for the Red Wall and, and those in the North West, which this decision will affect and yeah. impact, they want to see levelling up in action, yeah. don't they? And this is, this is, uh, this is the, 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 the prize exhibit in levelling up. If you can't do HS2 to the nor North West of England from, from Birmingham, then what is levelling up about? And that's why... And it, but it, the timings are so far away. I mean, 2040s is, is, is the completion date for some of these lines here. So it's a long way away, but I think it does matter. I mean, to, to be fair to Mr Sunak, he is MP, for Richmond in Yorkshire. Mm. He knows about it. He lives there. He comes from there. But there's a weakness, I think, around him that uh, Red Wall MPs I speak to wonder why they're not getting more preferment. They, they, they look at um, Boris Johnson as being the, the, the leader for the Red Wall. Mm. He's out of government. What's in it for them? So I think, politically, Mr Sinek must do something soon. Yes. But then Boris was, was wading in saying it's Treasury-driven nonsense, as if it's a bad thing to actually mm. be careful with money when we're 2.6 trillion quid in national debt. This leg alone is going to save 23 billion quid and we spoke to the MP for Crew and Nantwich earlier we worked out it wanted two billion quid a minute in the time it saves from a journey from Crew to London so isn't it a good idea actually to, to be prudent and financially um, astute with the money at a time when we've got hardly any money left and stop making everything about London yeah, I mean, there's an argument they should have started in, in Manchester, Martin, and worked yeah. down, worked south rather than starting in the south and working north. I mean, I think Boris Johnson was once against HS2, by the way. I think he wasn't always in <laughs> favour of it. Funny that. I'm sure he wrote articles uh, against it, but that, 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 that was back in the day. Yeah, I mean, no, no question that, you know, it, it's a big cost, it's a big drain uh, on, on, on resources, but they've, they've repackaged the PR behind it, so now it's on about, about, about lifting... Um, uh, um, uh, numbers, of, numbers of trains on the, on the route rather than worrying about speed, because speed is less important than just this freeing up more trains to work on those routes. Rishi Sunak hasn't got long now until Tory party conference kicks off on Sunday. How do you think he's going to try and fix this and offer something? Do you think he'll try and come up with an alternative, perhaps mm. suggest a, we were talking about it earlier, the M62 corridor going yes. kind of west to east? Is that something that perhaps... There is talk of, of, of money doing some kind of link between Hull, Manchester and Liverpool. That kind of, that'd be a new idea. Northern powerhouse rail, put money behind that. Mm. Um, I think the idea of rail is important. It's understood, you know, it moves communities around, but I think the problem HS2, it feels like a kind of a big, a big idea 15 years ago, which is now having its own issues. OK, Christopher, we're going to have to leave it there. You've just seen Patrick Christie Hove interview on our screens. Let's take a high speed link to him. Patrick, what have you got on today's show? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a little bit of viral marketing there. Subliminal messaging. Uh, look, I've got our city loads on. Uh, I am, of course, going to be talking uh, very much about Lampedusa. Mark White's over there for us. I'm going to be asking whether or not we should now only take women and children in light of the onslaught of mostly young men that are heading our way. Firearms officers, do you support them handing their weapons in? Look. Is it the right thing to do for them, or actually, should they get back to work? Patrick Christie's GB News. That warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there. Today's showers will ease during the rest of the day. Clear spells expected overnight, but it will stay breezy. However, not as windy as we're expecting things to turn during the middle of the week. This area of low pressure doesn't look like much over the next day or so. Storm Agnes, but it soon deepens as it approaches the UK and a swathe of very strong winds, gales widely, are expected around the middle of the week. 
Before that, Monday night, clear spells for most of us. Still rather breezy in the west and the northwest, but most places dry through the hours of darkness. The cloud thickening in the south and the west by the end of the night. Temperatures generally not far from average for the time of year. We're looking at the uh, low double figures generally. But we start off Tuesday with some showers getting going from the word go into the south and then the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast. They do clear through the morning. A rumble of thunder is possible as the showers turn livelier in places. A spell